Thank you for waiting, everybody. And it is time. I hope you like kicks. I hope you like combos. I hope you like devouring souls. Because it is time for Tales of Brasilia with Lurking SR. Woo. All right, so, <laughs> sorry, I didn't know I should start. Okay, so right before we start the run, I want to ask, so we had a bid war for language. Can we know which one is winning so we can get started? By $3, it's English. English, perfect. So we'll pick English here, and we can get ready to get started. All right, so before I start the run, um, I want to have my commentator introduce himself, so you can go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I'm the Grand Grand. I was uh, here before for Xenoblade X, and I'm here for this beautiful game that is Tales of Berseria um, as a commentator. All right, and uh, I think everything's good on my end, so whenever we can get started, you could uh, count me down, CC. Ooh, I get to count you down. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, go! All right. All right. So to get started with this game, we're going to be skipping a bunch of cutscenes, as we will be doing for the whole run. So there's not really any cutscenes, uh, thankfully. If I'm yeah. on the hunt for yeah. Yeah. Quite a few old Tales of Games have cutscenes that we have to match really hard, but this game is not one of them, thankfully, because uh, no, otherwise it would be really medicine. tedious. So I yeah. can't mess this up. All right, so basically to get started with the game, to explain a little bit about it, so the way that the combat works in the game is like it's an action RPG in a way, and you can assign all of the four face buttons on your controller into a different art. So what I did there is I assigned two different lines into one ability, and that will be there for the whole run. So the game, we're kind of overpowered from the very beginning, so I'm just kind of setting up all the best abilities on the character, on Velvet, who we'll be using for the whole game, and it's just going to stay there. Yeah, really funnily enough, the best arts of this game are just those arts that you get at the very, very start. You get like a few more later on, but they are not as important as the first two ones. So the first two that we have is Gouging Spin and Harsh Rebuttal. Uh, Gouging Spin is like obviously the better one, well, but we cannot only use one art because otherwise that's going to mess up the combo, so we have to use the second one. And Harsh Rebuttal is just the better, uh, the better option. Yep. Yeah, so um, this is just like, the game has a few tutorials here, so it's telling you about how combos work, so it's basically just kind of pressing buttons. And the other thing is souls. So if you look at the bottom left of the screen, you're going to see my character with like loose like diamonds next to her picture. That shows how many souls you have, and depending on how many souls you have is how many steps of the combo you can do. So basically our goal is to kind of have enough for a combo, but also not have too many for a reason we can explain later. But So for the second tutorial, the game is going to explain what Soul Gauge is. So while each blue crystal shows um, how many steps we can do in the combo, the blue crystal is actually turned red when you do different attacks, and that's like a gauge of how many attacks you can do without running out. And the other thing is, if you attack an enemy who's guarding, you'll lose gauge very quickly, and that's what the game was teaching us there, so as happened there. And yeah, as you can see, we're just kind of mashing out the two arts that we set up on every one of these prickle boards in the tutorial. Yep. There's going to be one more art that we'll have uh, that is going to be pretty important on the next tutorial. Yep. Um, for now, we only have, well, just two buttons. And uh, to explain a little bit of, about the combat, it's kind of an, an improvement of what the previous game uh, did. So the previous game was Tales of Zestiria, which is Not also bad. on PC. Uh, and it's uh, this game is actually a prequel of, um, of Zestiria. And while the stereo is also really interesting, but a lot, has a lot more variance in the strat and whatever it can happen, this game is a lot more consistent when uh, regarding status, debuffs, uh, gauges, combos, and everything. So it's going to play out very, very differently despite being pretty close when you look at it at first yeah. glance. Yeah, so here coming up will be the next tutorial, which uh, as we mentioned earlier, we're going to get the third art that we're going to have for the rest of the run, which is Searing Edge. So the game is going to introduce us to it, introduce us to it here. I'm going to have to go into the menu and actually put it in. So as you can see, it's a little bit of AOE, uh, but more importantly, it's uh, it's an art that can make burn. 
Yep, that debuff is really, really nice. Yep, and it's also a fire attack, so we're going to be using it later for any enemy that's weak against fire to kind of proc their weaknesses. And the other main thing about it is that it is a hidden art. So in this game, there's three different types of arts. We'll be using two, which is martial arts and hidden arts. And whenever you use one of them, they buff the other one in some way, or the other type in some way, um, for the rest of the combo. So whenever we use Searing Edge, our other martial arts, which include Gouging Spin, uh, will have more likelihood to do status ailments, which increase stun rates. Yeah, so Searing Edge can inflict burn, which is pretty which is a pretty nice status effect because it's not going to deal damage over time like it usually would, but instead it's going to increase the stun, uh, the stun duration, well, not the stun, the stagger duration of an enemy, which is very, very valuable when you are trying to do really long combos. And uh, Gouging Spin and the Harsh Orbital have the ability to inflict stun, which is going to increase, to heavily increase your damage and uh, make the enemy like stay in combo for the duration of the stun. So mm -hmm. if we can keep the stun going, we're going to deal a lot of damage and we're going to be able to keep the combos going. And because the stagger is going to stay, because the burn is a different uh, debuff, then uh, we can have some crazy combos going on. Yeah. Yeah, so um, as we get further into the run, the more, like, we get stronger and more likely to stun. So we're going to get to a point where enemies will be perma-stunned. But uh, also to go back a little bit, if you saw in the shop there, I bought one item basically and then sold a lot. But if you really paid close attention, you, you probably realized that I actually bought items and then sold them back and then bought them back and then sold them back. The reason is the game has like shop levels and when you buy or sell enough things, your shop level increases and you get rewards for different shop levels. And shop level two gives us like a passive item that increases movement speed. So even though it's hard to see, Velvet is now moving at, I think, 10% higher speed than she was before I did that shop. Movement is good because we're going to mo be moving around a lot in this game. Yeah. So there's going to be like three other spots in the run where movement speed increases a little bit. But for now, for the next like maybe 50 minutes, we're going to be at this speed. And so now to talk a little bit more about the story. So Velvet is just a young girl who is uh, just doing girl things, you know, just good. hunting. It's uh, taking care of her brother, uh, left set, and uh, cooking stuff. So that's why we're hunting in Prickle Boar. And now we figured out that like left set is uh, is gone, so we have to find him again. Yeah. And we are taking him over to the cave because he wants to pick flowers. And you know, nothing bad could possibly happen, right? Like yeah. getting attacked by a wolf demon. Right. So this fight, you actually cannot beat. It's just a timed fight that ends after a certain amount of seconds passes. So while we wait, I'm actually just going to spam Searing Edge because the more you use an art in this game, you get like art usage on it, and that actually makes it a little bit stronger. So we just use this time to spam an ability to make it better for later fights. But there's really nothing we can do to speed this up. So basically what the game was explaining here in terms of lore is that there is some big evil demons in the world that exist and they are not you cannot defeat them unless you've got some magical power yeah. which are seraph or if you're yourself for demons uh, I, yeah. that's kind of a weird point but maybe this will come out later on also uh yeah this is the first village in an rpg nothing uh, nothing really different from what we are used to see yeah just people dying because you know a random amount of mobs came and attacked the town and we were asleep throughout the whole thing, and now we want to go find where our brother is, and uh, obviously nothing bad could possibly happen to him here. Don't give up. Yeah, this Never is a very, up. very chill and uh, hearty, hearty anime game. It's, it, it's all good. We're a, a cute girl doing cute things. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you just have to run through this area one more time for now. Uh, to basically go back to the place we just were just a second ago because this game really likes to make you run through the same areas over and over again <laughs> as we will see <laughs> the more we get into the run right. oh hey this is quite a setting okay. all right so here is screaming warning is what i will say so the game will introduce us to a few arts because velvet just turned into a demon and these arts are kind of leading to things we will unlock later on in the run so right now Lurking is just pressing buttons randomly and it's go going to pull up uh, like those arts completely indifferently. Um, 
And they're just good, so it works out. And yeah. yeah, so those uh, wolf demons that we were unable to defeat, now we can just destroy them. Yep. Yeah. So now we are a demon with, you know, demon powers, a demon hand that can... We basically are a demon that can eat other demons, First, and that's there will be a test. basically what we were doing there, even though it, it looks like we were beating them up, we were actually, like, devouring, you. consuming them. Okay. And now, uh, fast forward a few years later, uh, Velvet is in a prison and is given food uh, in the form of demon to devour every now and then. And, uh, well, this Seraph just arrived and uh, is ready to save her. Yeah. So we knew from earlier that this is this Seraph is one of Arthur's like Seraphs, and basically she is broken through his power and isn't like just obeying him anymore and wants to help us. And the reason we want to help us is, as Velvet finds out here, is this is actually her sister's reincarnation. So whenever humans die in this game, well, sometimes not always, they get reincarnated as Seraphims or like you know magical beings and. That is her sister, and that's why she's trying to help her out of the prison. Yep. And the Arthur, by the way, is a Velvet's step brother. Yep. And he is the one who killed uh, Velvet's brother earlier, and that's why she was screaming about, like, why did you kill him and all that. And now she just has one world in her head. Revenge. Revenge. Yep. And that is going to be basically the story of this game, is trying to kill him for killing yep. our younger brother earlier. So Tales of Berserk, yeah, very much uh, hints for Berserk. And uh, that's pretty much Velvet. So cute girl doing cute things, that's over now. That's gone. That was only in the prologue. <laughs> now we've got Demon Velvet, who is got, just going to punch things and devour stuff. Yep. So at this point of the run, we are kind of restricted to a few abilities. We don't have our main form of damage yet. So it's kind of just spamming our two arts and hope for stuns. Stuns are in a way random and in a way not, which I will elaborate on that a little bit more. But before we move on, we had incentive for character outfits and we just we can start changing velvet's outfits so uh cc if you could let me know what is in first place right now and that will be velvet's costume for the rest of the run and after a quick refresh it looks like maid is in the lead by 15 dollars all right oh, no. since it's made <laughs> we will go and unlock it it's at your service velvet so and oh my god <laughs> And you did the hair, no! And I will say is as we move on, we, so the maid is not fully won, so basically as we unlock more characters, whatever is the most donated to will go to that specific character. So if you want to see any other costumes, you could keep donating for that and we can have it on all the other characters. Come on, really? All right, so now we um, just met another one of the characters who will eventually be in the party, but as of right now, she's kind of just tagging along and messing around. So... Just to point this out, I really hate this outfit, and I really hate the fact that we are going to have to watch it for four hours. So thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> hey, it's what people wanted to see, and that's what we're going to give. Uh, not sure. Right, so here, coming up next, is going to be another fight where we're going to basically continue just having to spam arts and, you know, he might look a little bit unique compared to the other enemies. It's because he's going to actually be in the party. But for now, this actually is one of the more annoying fights, is this guy can dodge a lot, and he can defend a lot. Oh, and we got a burn on him. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. So this fight can actually end like almost instantaneously if you get a stun and then Ceres. Well, to talk a little bit about Ceres, we actually can't control her. She does whatever she wants. So if she does her strongest ability and then Roker or stuns, he just dies. That is one of those fights that can end in like 5 seconds or 25 seconds. And that's kind of common in this run. So a lot of the early game is one of those where like, if you get lucky, you insta-devour the fight. If you don't, you're going to be there just watching an enemy guard for what feels like an eternity. <laughs> Hey, you'll see that the fights later on are going to go much faster, so when you are stuck, not being able to do a combo, then it feels pretty bad. So another thing is, as we stun enemies, we get another soul, which we were talking about earlier, which makes us do longer combos. Ceres can sometimes just on, take that stun from you, and we get nothing out of it. So if she does that, that's kind of a way to lose a lot of time in the fight. 
And that's not only for Sirius, but also later on with the AI just kind of messing around and stealing stuns or stealing status ailments. I am aware. That is why I chose you. So right now, uh, Velvet decided to do a giant uh, superhero landing, and it's just sure? fine because she's this a demon. Leads to the yeah. main entrance. If they know you're here, cool lady. They'll have found your ship by now. Yeah, Velvet does some some great stuff. She rear, is an amazing character. But uh, here, there's gonna be like basically two more fights before we can exit this completely escape from this prison. First one is Oscar, who's right. like one of the main villains Priceless of the game. But of course, he's still not gonna do much to us. It's one of the easier fights still. Well, villain. He's like this right hood pal uh, paladin who's just doing his job of killing demons. But he's a bad guy because we're kind of not really the good guy here. Well, I wouldn't say he's a bad guy because we are clearly the bad guys in this game and that will kind of continue to be the, the case of... <laughs> like, neither Velvet or anyone else in the party are actually, like, quote-unquote heroic. It's more like an anti-hero kind of situation going on. But yeah, for Oscar, we don't actually have to kill him. We just have to get him to a quarter HP and then... For next, it's gonna be this dragon. And this is where we unlock Break Souls. So, Break Souls is similar to the abilities that we saw earlier in the fight where Velvet was screaming. And Break Souls let us extend our combo. So, as you're gonna see here after I go to down to 0 HP, every time I Break Soul, it, re it eats one of my souls. But it resets my combo, so I can actually keep going past the, you know, three or four combo stages that I have. And this is going to be basically the core thing that we use in order to do super long combos and one-shot enemies. So we're just going to keep going here until this guy dies. We, like, our combo can't end. If stuns line up to where you kind of keep getting the souls back that you use, and you can actually infinite combo enemies to an extent. Yeah, so every time you hit a stun, or you hit a burn, or a status effect, this is going to give you back a soul. Oh, actually, you're stealing a soul from from the enemy, which is yeah. pretty relevant. Uh, and also, every time you are using a break soul, that's giving the, uh, the enemy a soul, which is also really irrelevant. But we're going to talk about that later on when that's going to be quite relevant. For now, it's uh, just a thing that happens. Yeah, so a bit in the story is now we escape from the prison and having to go to find the next town because our ship crashed. And this is where we start seeing overworld enemies. And in this run, ideally you would get zero encounters. You can avoid any encounter by just walking around them or dodging them. But some of them are not as simple. So as you saw, there's a lot of beetles there. Those are actually like some of the hardest enemies in the whole game to dodge encounters from because they can kind of just dash at you and you have no way of avoiding them. So there is a one reason, funny thing about this game is that if you're looking at a wall, walking onto it, then enemies are not going to aggro you for whatever reason. Yeah. So you can always just make sure you are not going to be hit by an encounter even though it's moving faster than you by just looking at the wall. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Except beetles that are rushing at you because they are not stopping. So yeah. So that some enemies to run towards you, some enemies dash towards your direction, so even if you move like sideways, they're still gonna keep going in the specific direction they started. So those enemies, you can't just go to walls to avoid them, because if they're dashing at you, they will keep going. And that includes beetles and boars that we'll see later. There's a ladder. And then you also have teleporting enemies, and yep. those are fun too. You're teleporting enemies and invisible enemies. <laughs> and... Te invisible teleporting enemies too. <laughs> First down. So here we're just going to be grabbing some chests, including uh, equipment and geld. Those are going to be important as we go forward because the equipment we're really not going to use, all going to be to kind of get materials out of it. And geld is going to be to buy, uh, buy weapons and later on some items that allow us to move over the world faster. So this is going to be the tutorial for forging stuff that is coming up pretty soon. Uh, it's actually the second time we visit the town. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I misremembered it. So for now, we're actually going to just unlock Rokuro and go to fight, or go to the next dungeon to fight the next boss. Because basically, we're trying to get the, the, the shipping guild in this town to help us out in fixing our ship, but then they're in trouble with the government. So they're asking us to find the guy that got them in trouble, and that's where we're going to be going next. Yeah, so now we unlocked Rokuro. First thing I'm going to do to Rokuro and every other character that we unlock uh, soon is go to their arts menu and make their AI only use one ability rather than all of them.
because you could just make the AI use their one best ability and spam it rather than them trying to mess around and do different stuff when most of their abilities are actually kind of weak. There's also another thing that you were supposed to do, right? Uh, costume? Oh yeah, that's true. We, we <laughs> just unlocked Rokuro, so can you let us know if Maiden Butler is still the top costume or if something beat it? Please, no. Oh, something beat it. Yes! <laughs> we have a $16 donation from AJ Deeds. How much did the pirate pay for their ear piercings? A buccaneer. <laughs> and with that, pirate is in the lead by $1. So we're on the pirate train, baby. Thank you so much for the donation. And I will give Rokuro the pirate costume. So let's go unlock it from here. It's the Sea of Scrooge Rokuro. And strong oh, menu. There we go. Pretty fancy. All right. So now that we walk into this town, first thing we're gonna do is go to the shop and buy out the entire shop. So we're only gonna be using the amber blade that I just bought, but the other stuff is still very relevant to upgrading that amber blade and the build that I have on. But uh, that's gonna be after this next dungeon. For now, we're gonna get a cooking tutorial. So one of the things you can do in this game is cook, and different meals give you different buffs. We special. never use that in the run. So all the buffs are actually kind of insignificant. The only thing that they're useful for is that whenever you eat, you heal. So I might have to eat if I took an encounter, I just wanted to heal my characters to full, but that's really the only use for that. And again, we shouldn't take any kind of encounters for the yeah. run. And one thing to note is that the game Outside of the tutorials that we got in the Bricklebore fights earlier, some of the tutorials are actually forced behind getting encounters, and they kind of stay there for the entire run until we see the tutorial. So later on, if we get into really scary encounters, the tutorial is going to pop up, even though we're at the end of the game. And you cannot die during the tutorial, you could just escape from the encounter. So they're actually very handy to not get encounters early on, because that's a safety net for later on where encounters can kill us if we actually get into one. But for now, we just have to run through this dungeon, and there's really nothing interesting here, so we if you want to take it over CC for anything Watch you have step. to share, please go ahead for the next few minutes, stuck. for the next like minute or two. Running in my Tales of Brasaria game? No way. We have a $40 donation from OGN Drassi R. This is for lurking, less than three. We have another $25 from AJ Deeds. Let's see the Myx Mystic Arts Showcase and hit 50k tonight. And another $30 from My Hero Zero with no comment. And another $5 donation from Novice, first time watcher, first time donator. May Carl and his children bless your run. We are all watching you lurking. Good luck. Thank you so much. All right, so now we are almost in the next boss. So uh, I think there's pretty much one more screen to go through. So one thing that's going to be like a recurring theme of this game is dungeons are very unexciting. They're all just running through screens with nothing in them other than encounters that you have to avoid. Some of them later have puzzles, but the puzzles are really not anything that you have to think about. It's just running through the same motion every time. Yep. Unlike uh, good old Golden Sun that was here this morning, uh, this Tales of game is really not that interesting. Regarding <laughs> dungeons. So please make more interesting puzzles in uh, in video games, you please. That's uh, that, that's a really cool thing. Makes, uh, makes dungeons interesting. interesting. Yeah. So as you can see in the map at the top, there is a star. That means that is where we're heading to. First off, I have to grab this teleporter because the game doesn't actually unlock teleporters for you. You have to step on them first. And if we don't, we're going to have to run through the entire dungeon again later. So it's one of those things that you have to remember or you're just going to be sad as you run through a dungeon for another five minutes. All right, so here's the boss. It's going to give us a tutorial on what weak point combos are. And basically, each enemy has some status if, uh, or some elements they're weak to. And if you hit all of them in one combo, it'll proc chain. So if you see under my combo counter, it says chain uh, times 1.83. That means the boss is taking that much more damage because you proc a weak point combo on him. So we're going to be trying to do that on every boss that we can. 
for this early fight, there's not much we can do. It all depends on our stun luck. And as we can see, he's not getting stunned. There we go. So one thing that's important in this fight, and actually in the Drake fight earlier, is we're going to be trying to get combo kills on enemies. And a combo kill is killing an enemy with a combo counter of 40 or higher. And that will unlock a title called Combo Artist that we'll be using on Velvet. And that is important because Combo Artist is a damage multiplier depending on how long your combos are. So it's a title that just makes us do more damage the longer our combos are. Uh. And as we know, and as I mentioned <laughs> earlier, combos will be very long in this game. So the way that that title works is it gives you 1% more damage for each combo uh, number you have on. But that is actually a multiplicative 1%, so... You know, when you get the 2%, that includes the initial 1% that you got on it. So, if you're at 100 combo, it's not actually 100% increased damage. It's like, I don't know, 140 or something. I don't remember the exact number. It's exponential, basically. Yeah, it's exponential. And not only is the combo artist exponential, but any other damage multiplier in the game that we're going to talk about is all exponential. So, it includes that, stuns that doubles your damage, break souls, actually. As you do more break souls in a combo, you get more damage up to a certain extent that will also be multiplicative. So that's basically how we're going to be one-shotting enemies is so many multiplicative exponential damage buffs all stacking on top of each other and then following it up by whatever our most damaging ability is at the end of it. Yeah, so if you remember the Tales of the Syria run from RPG LB in 2019 where we were having a lot of trouble getting combos going and getting damage going, well, this game is completely the opposite. You get so much damage that you can manage to one-shot every enemy super easily, super fast, as long as you know what you're doing. Which is kind of really hard, because most of the mechanics that we've mentioned so far is uh, really not this explained by the game. Set. So it's good. really Great. just uh, Phil Visage at first that rediscovered and figured out everything that we know regarding the gameplay mechanics of this game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for now the game's teaching us about how we can upgrade our weapons. So it's enhancing and dismantling weapons. So every time we have a weapon, it has a specific um, type of ore that it uses to upgrade it. And everything we're using is um, amber. And the other thing here, I will explain why I'm doing this, but I'm upgrading weapons before I dismantle them. And that will be very relevant for later. And now I'm just going to upgrade my Amber Blade to plus three, Rokuru stuff, and then the Amber Belt to plus one. So earlier on, I bought out an entire shop and I also grabbed a chest with a fire ring and I unequipped everything Rokuru had on him that doesn't do damage. It's all of that is just so we can dismantle it to get more Amber to upgrade Velvet's weapon and belt because Velvet's really the only relevant character. We don't care about anyone else having stats. And then the reason I was upgrading things to plus one before dismantling them is because Every time you dismantle something that is upgraded to plus one, you get 100% of the materials that upgraded it back. So, you know, each weapon gives you one amber and then upgrading it to plus one gives costs one amber. But if you dismantle it, it gives you two back. So you're getting everything back plus extra. So the extra thing we're getting is coarse tampering powder. And that is another um, ore that we need in order to upgrade weapons. And we can only get that by dismantling weapons that are plus one or more. And we're going to be needing about 18 of those throughout the run. So at this shop, I intentionally upgraded four weapons to plus one and dismantled them. And as we go further, I'm going to continue doing it until we have all the tampering powders we need for the rest of the run. Yep. So that's why we have to buy a lot of equipment. And also, every time we are for, uh, forging and enhancing a, a weapon or an armor or whatever, this is going to cost some gold. So again, you can clearly see that gold is going to be... Uh, a very, very important factor for all, uh, all of this management. So that chest over there is a life bottle, which is, you know, equivalent. It's the item that resurrects any dead character in a battle. It's not necessary for any fight, but it's just a backup. Yes, unlike most RPGs where, or most Tales games even, where you are expecting characters to die and you are going to expect to revive people, well, Velvet is uh, basically invincible because, as we mentioned earlier, uh, when you use Velvet's break soul, she goes in Terran mode, and in Terran mode, she is going to lose uh, HP every second, uh, and it's going to go ev uh, even higher the longer you are in Terran mode. And once you hit one HP, you don't die. 
when you when you hit one HP, you get to use uh, another break soul from Velvet that is dependent on the enemy type. So if you see a human, for example, she's going to use Discord, um, and uh, therefore you can then reuse a break soul that is going to give a Velvet like an extra 100 HP, and so she can keep going. So as long as you've got more than three uh, soul, um, soul, uh, soul, yeah, yeah. As long as you've got um, three souls uh, and therefore can use uh, the break soul, Velvet is in invisible. Yeah. And so because stuns uh, are really easy to proc, well, there's no really good way to die. Yeah, so Velvet, like, that's probably also if you play it casually, it's something that you probably discovered is that Velvet is just invincible. And that is something that we use in the run because later on we're going to be intentionally getting Velvet to low HP. And her being invincible is a very convenient way to get her to low Sorry, HP without Margaret. dying. Rest in peace. So that mechanic will be used throughout the whole run of just break souling so you just can't die. Oh yeah, Velvet was already broken, but she's even more broken because she's invincible. <laughs> just... There is something really wrong with this character. <laughs> but it makes the run more entertaining, so... Oh yeah, for sure. Imagine, good. imagine uh, hitting one, uh, zero HP with Velvet being a thing that'd be so sad yeah so here as i mentioned earlier we have to go through the dungeon again but thankfully they were kind enough to put a teleporter that takes you from the beginning to the end of it if i didn't grab it we would have had to run through the whole thing again but now we're just at the very end again and here there's like a, a cool thing about this game is whenever you talk to any npc they turn around to face you before they start talking and they take so long to face you it's quicker to walk around this guy and any other NPC we talk to. So we're actually facing them before talking to them. Because otherwise they're going to just stand there for like a couple seconds and then slowly turn around and start talking to you. And then now that we've got uh, our good old pirate down, we are going back to the town and uh, basically stealing a ship. Yeah, so our ship was broken beyond fixing and we need to steal one because we don't want to stay in this town. And at the same time, the you know the government, the exorcists as they are, who cleanse demons, Sleep know that there are Velvet some demons Sleep around, which you know is Velvet. So they're going to be on the lookout, and we're going to be having to go through a lot of different guards and exorcists who are trying to stop us from stealing a ship. But, as we, he... but we don't care, and we are going to vault into the town because yeah. we're just demons. Yep. So. I just upgraded a bunch of weapons, so you probably realized earlier how long it was taking me to kill enemies, but now that I upgraded weapons as, just, as much as I did, they just die. <laughs> they were nothing. But he here's the fun thing, is I'm gonna actually unequip these weapons now, because for the next fight, I want to do less damage. And the reason is, I did mention earlier that we need combo kills, which is killing enemies with a combo right. or 40 or higher. This next fight has six enemies that you can combo kill. I've already combo killed one, so I need to do four more. And this is the perfect fight to do it. So the reason I took out some of my equipment because I don't want to do too much damage and kill them quickly. So for these long the guys with the long swords, um, they can be killed with long combos. And that is what we're going to be trying to do here. So I put Rokuro in defense because I don't want him doing damage. Oh, 40, okay. So that was one combo kill. And Discord is the break art that Velvet does whenever she hits a human. And all of these people are humans. And Discord is very convenient is because it does little damage, but it does 12 hits. So it's very easy to increase our combo rate with Discord. So we're going to be trying to spam it as much as we can. So I'm going to kill these guys to collect more souls. And then go back to the other guy with a lot of HP. And kill him. There we go. This guy is too low HP, so we're just gonna let him go. These small ones, we just kinda two shot anyways. Also, shout outs to uh, Velvet's voice actress for uh, the Discord uh, cries because they are really amazing. Here, again, Discord. We just kinda keep doing more combo hits. And this guy should be almost dead. Another 40 combo. Also, you might have noticed that uh, Lurking is switching to uh, Rokuro every time Velvet is using Discord. That's because, as you can see, there is some hits on the character that is uh, being played. And considering Discord is 9 hits, uh, all those um, hits done is really slow. 
And since it takes no time to switch character, we just do that to save time. I'll show it here. So if I don't switch, this is how Discord goes. As cool as it is, it's slow. Meanwhile, if I hit this guy and I'll show it again here, oh, this is how it goes. Significantly faster. Worth noting that if you're playing on auto, you actually kind of still control the, the game, but there is no hit stun whatsoever. Yeah. So it's a really, it's a cool mechanic for uh, all bosses. Oh, I didn't get enough combo kills. So we're gonna try to get one here. If not, I accidentally killed too many enemies with a lot of damage. So we're just gonna try to get one on on Teresa here. If not, then there's later fights we can get it. Just the earlier we get it, the better because it is a significant increase to damage. It. And it really is going to be necessary later on. Like for now, we are still just controlling the fight and doing good combos. But later on, you're gonna see that those combos are. I mean, even going to be even awesome. in this fight, if we had combo artists, it would be going so much better. But it's not to the point where it's too bad. And she actually got burnt, so that should help me get a combo kill on her ideally. Casual 83 combo. Yep. So, Krokura might have stolen the kill there, but I don't think he did. No. Yeah, because there was like the whole thing of like you killed an enemy, so. This is actually the only time in the game the game gives you like a combo artist. Now yep. so, good. so now here we just have to talk to a few people. I'm gonna have to open Velvet's equipment menu just to equip combo artist. But yeah, so combo artist will be on for the whole run. And actually, the build that I have on will be on for the whole run. So even not just arts, but also equipments that we get early on are also still the best in the game. At least in a quick setting, not in like, you know, if you have time to grind anything out. Alright, so this is Aizen here. Um, he's a Seraph, but also a pirate. So he looks cool. And the G. And if you remember this, this might ring a bell. Yeah. And again, he's a character that looks unique and has cool music, so... Would you be surprised if I said he's gonna be in the party after this? Yeah. So this is actually one of the like only fights in the game that we just can't do anything about. Aizen can defend, he can dodge, he can do whatever he wants. And Luffy Set is there now in our party, and he's very good at stealing stuns because the art he uses generates a lot of stun. And he did it twice there, so... That fight can end instantly, basically, if if Velvet gets everything from the burn to the stun, or it could take long. That wasn't the worst uh, fight that it that could have happened. So now that we've got new characters, um, yeah, yeah, there's a, a thing that we have to check out, which is costumes. Yes, so we have Luffy set now, and Aizen will be there in like a couple minutes. So can you let us know what is there now? And if anyone wants to snipe that, you have about a minute or two after this. Oh man, it's been going back and forth behind the scenes here. We have $50 from Grumble Cake. Pirate costume? No way. Here's some cash money to get Tales of Legacy into the game. Ooh. So now Tales of Legacy is catching up to Pirate and Maid. And then Acid Fire Boom donated $25. The ships of Bazaria have set sail. Let's get Pirate Rokuro. And then the Burning Hunter donated $10. Did someone say Bid War? To the Battling Maiden Butler Cafe and $5 to the Mystic Arts Showcase. So now with a refresh on the bids... Maiden Butler is winning by four dollars. Maiden oh, Butler. No. All right, so that will actually go on Aizen and Luffy set because by now we already unlocked Aizen too. So let's go in here, Maiden Butler, uh, Aizen, and Luffy. Ooh. Okay, that that's fine. That's fine. And now that we unlock the characters, just like I did with Rokuro and I did with Velvet, I am going to remove all their equipment that doesn't deal damage so we can dismantle it. And for Velvet, we're gonna, we just unlocked Mega Sonic Thrust, so I'm going to equip that. And then take out 
the other characters is weakest arts and only leave one on. So it's going to be form one on Rokuro as it is, and then also wind lance on Aizen. And Luffy is... Right shade. But yeah, um, so here there's going to be a little bit more of movement. So CC, we have probably a couple minutes here that you can take it over for. I have a donation here that explains my feelings about the pirate costume losing. We have $15 from Airplane. Artorius! And then we have $25 from Heads Up Level Up. Like many others, mental health and treatments for it are extremely near and dear to me. And what better time to donate than during one of my favorite games of my favorite series, Tales of Berseria. Second only to Zillia, of course. Good luck to the runners. Much love to everyone watching. And as always, cute chat is cute. Cute chat is cute. Very Good choices. Cute. Zillia is a, is a really cool game. Cool characters. Yeah. If we were doing an old bosses run, which unfortunately we are not, we will see some Zillia characters show up in this game, actually. Oh, yeah. All right. So here um, we just met... One of the people who will be running a lot of the shops in the game, the Turtles, it's our current character in Tails. Unfortunately, we don't talk to him here or anything, but later on we'll buy a few things from him. And uh, that is it for him. So, actually, I don't think there is any Turtles in uh, our eyes. Thinking about it, uh, I haven't played it yet, so I'm not sure. But that oh, is unfortunate no. because it's a great character that keeps showing up. Yeah. So here we're gonna be grabbing a. A multiple chests throughout the run from here on out all that give items that dismantle into bronze scrap because bronze scrap is the material that's going to be used to equip velvet's main weapon that we're going to use but all of the bronze web uh, equipment are actually like some of the unique ones unlike the amber one that we used for you know the belt so we can't really buy those easily so it's just going to be grabbing chests and also hoping for them from random drops which can happen from fights or from these sparkles that I'm going to be picking up throughout the next maybe hour or so. I'm only going to be grabbing specific ones that I know give something useful. Most of them don't. You did your research. I had so there is, there is one specific cool item that we'll want uh, later on, but I don't think it's going to spawn for now. No, not yet. Yeah. So actually, there is no like real way that we know what is in these random sparkles. like. There is no database or anything that shows all of it. All of it is kind of just runner experience, <laughs> grabbing things here and there and seeing where you got something useful. So there, there might be a lot of places where we can get good stuff that we just don't know about yet because there just there isn't a way to know what they did as far as we know. Well, there's probably some way, but no one has dig yeah. uh, too far inside, into that because like it's not ne necessary for now. Like we we yeah. are too good already. Yeah. Not going to change much if we know about it or not. Yeah. So the only thing it would change is like we can skip a couple of chests here and there but they're minor like time saves not they're never necessary and even the time that they save is not much so actually here in this next screen there's a decent chance they didn't even spawn but this wall can have two spawns of sparkles and more often than not they have at least something useful all right so this game really likes gates um Actually, I don't think you get to open it for now. You don't open the gate for now. This game likes three things. Gates, ladders, which we're going to be climbing a lot of, and bridges. I will elaborate on the bridges part later when we see bridges. But for now, there's just a lot of ladders. But a little bit of lore of what's going on is we are trying to get our ship to the main, you know, the capital of the world, I guess. But there is a big defense fortress there that the government set up, the Abbey, as they call it in the game. Um, and they don't want to allow a pirate ship because we are hanging out with pirates now through. So we're trying to go in and basically destroy their defenses so we can get our pirate ship where we're not allowed to. So again, we're not good people in this game. And we're pirates. Pirate and, and demons, so like, yeah. People don't really like us. Yeah. So the entirety of the game is going to be people trying to come after us and then we're like, yeah, you're not doing that. I'm going <laughs> to do what I want. <laughs> Freedom. So this is basically One Piece, huh? Uh, in a way, yeah. So here I'm going to be grabbing another chest. That one actually has an Earth Ring, which dismantles into Calcite, and that will be upgrading the boots that I will get after this segment of the run. Now to 
take care of that ship. Right. So we had to steal a key to get to like the main control room. Now we got the key, we have to backtrack. Again, this game does that a lot. I promise I won't get mad if you talk. And at the same time, Velvet is again being like a I guess like a little thing is that earlier when we fought Teresa, there was this little kid with her that we beat up and he looked like your brother that died and she's like, oh, I want to kidnap him and basically making a substitute to my brother that died. So for now, she's basically just constantly trying to get him to like her. Yeah, she totally doesn't have some giant trauma and I'm sure she would need some help from, uh, I don't know, Nami maybe? That'd be great. That would be great. So again, here we are going to be grabbing more chests. All of that is to stock up on bronze because that will be very important later on. And we mentioned gates. Keep in mind this gate over here, the giant one, because it's going to be important in about... Actually, a little bit later, in probably about a couple minutes. <laughs> I never really paid attention to it, but it looks really cool from here. Yeah. Oh, I was... <laughs> out. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's my fault. That's on me. <laughs> I just wanted to show the the, the gate. And <laughs> but yeah, if an encounter happens, you just have to run to the borders of the arena, and you escape from the fight. It's really not a problem. Usually, it's a small time loss. <laughs> look, it's not a marathon run without some memes, right? Yeah. I mean, look at Velvet. That's true. I know there is a specific runner of this game that's probably very disappointed right now. Because I know he's always, uh... was unhappy whenever I used this costume. I mean, there is one person right next to you that is really unhappy right now, so... <laughs> well, there's two now. <laughs> right. So here I'm gonna grab a Dinor bottle. I actually got one earlier, I forgot to talk about it. But it's a item that lets you instantly leave dungeons. So I grabbed one here and I'm gonna be using it right after this fight. But this fight coming up is kinda the... One of the most cursed try, uh, fights in the whole run on how fast or slow it can go. So basically, all you have to do is put your AI in attack and just start attacking the enemies. And there's not much you can do other than hope that they stack up and get stunned. Also, you're wide open. You're wide open. That is Aizen's break soul that we're going to be using a lot. But yeah, this fight went really badly so far because the enemies kind of all spread out and also I didn't get the stuns that I wanted on Velvet so other people got the souls instead of her. Yes, one thing we didn't really mention is that like sure Velvet has her consuming low uh, break soul but every character has their own uh, break soul that is really defining their character so you've got uh, left set who is going to boost your defense uh, I think and maybe boost the stagger duration on bosses yeah. for some weird reason. Uh, you've got Rokoro who is going to counter an attack Let's whenever he's... Uh, so like when he takes an attack and he's using his break soul, he's going to counter. And uh, Aizen, when an enemy is stunned, he's going to go Draconic form and you, uh, you throw a giant fireball at them and deal massive damage. So yeah. obviously massive damage is good. Yeah. So that fight... If you looked at the in-game timer, nice. I actually beat it in 35 seconds. That fight can end in less than 10 seconds, if you get really lucky. It all just depends on whether the enemies decide to stack or not, and whether they decide to stun or not, and if any of your AI takes the stuns from you. But uh, So there, from the sparkles, I actually got two Amber Fragments. Amber Fragments are not as useful as Bronze, but they're still good. I can buy less things from the shop, which means I can grab less Gal Chests. Look, a gate. Yep. We can see it now without getting, you know, hit by encounters, but yeah. But yeah, um, we were speaking about break souls. Break souls, we won't really use many, except for way later, we're going to use Lafayette sets, like near the end, in the end game. But for now, it's only going to be Velvets and Aizens that are useful, because Aizens does massive damage and Velvet, you know, we already talked a lot about how she can extend combos, not die and all that. But... That being said, I will be actually using the Break Souls on everyone, but not for the effects of them, but only because, as we mentioned, whenever you use a Break Soul, it's not using your soul, it's giving your soul to the enemy. And we're going to be spamming every Break Soul with every character just to give our souls to the enemy. 
because the more souls the enemy has, the weaker they are. We can explain that later, but for now we have a gate. Gate! So, you know, my hands off the controller, we can sit back for about 20 seconds. As this door opens, it is the only unskippable cutscene. <laughs> Hell yeah, someone else loved Gate here. <laughs> That's the spirit of the game here. Right. And it's open. Let's meet up with the Von Eltia. So coming up is going to be another tutorial. So this is where we unlock Mystic Arts. Mystic Arts is the game's like you know strongest art that you can do in each character. So in the tutorial, you actually don't lose souls whenever you break soul. So I'm going to just kind of start off a combo with Velvet on this enemy, and then break soul. And just look at the damage; it's going to speak for itself. So that was without many multipliers, just some break soul damage multipliers. You do 6k. And we sell stun too. Yep. And for the rest of this fight, we're just gonna use Break Souls to infinite loop this enemy. So worth noting that um, MAs uh, uses uh, BGs, so Blessed Gouge Points. I think that's, a, that's the name. Yes. Uh, so that's a little circle next to the character's name. Um, so uh, an MA is going to use three uh, BGs, and um, every time you use a Break Soul, that's also going to give you some uh, BG Goge, so that's not going to give you one point straight away, but that's going to give you some Goge. Um, and it's uh, pretty important to know because, like, uh, again, our best way to deal damage is uh, using those BG, uh, those MAs which consume BGs, and therefore uh, spamming uh, even more reason to spam Break Souls. Yeah. So the only other way to restore BG is in rests, but we don't get to do in rests a lot in the run, so we have to tightly route BG. But now that we have a lot of characters, there is this menu, the strategy menu, which kind of tells the AI what to do, and we're going to be changing all the AI to do nothing. Yeah, again, AI is uh, useless because we've got Velvet. Yeah, so, I mean, we mentioned earlier how Luffy was taking my stuns, and that's annoying, and later in the run, him taking uh, any stuns from Velvet can end the combo and basically you can't do the fight anymore. So the AI actually hinders you more than it helps you. So we're just gonna put them on defense and... Here there's a little shop. So something interesting about shops is just like in this area, shops are completely random. Uh, or uh, rather it's random because it's going to pick uh, random items in the item pools it can have and show it to you. And therefore, we can never really tell what exactly we are going to get in shops. Um, so that's why uh, it wasn't like a very, very fast menu here. And uh, but unlike this area, uh, you can you you have a set amount of items that you can have, or minimum amount you can have. Because in this area, you can have zero. Yeah. And you feel really sad when that happens. Yeah. So actually, what happened there was there's a lot of items in the shop. That it took me a bit to figure, like, to find the items that I'm looking for. But basically what I did is I bought Kalkai boots, and those immediately went to Velvet. They're the best boots that we can have so far. And then I did some of the enhancing and dismantling that I mentioned to get core Stampering Powder. And then I upgraded my Amber Belt to plus three. That makes it as strong as it could go so far. And then I also did, you know, ring to plus one, boots to plus two, just to max out stats as much as we can for so the point in the run we are at. Yeah, we never really talked about uh, stats, but obviously this is an RPG and there is different, a bunch of different stats. So in order to deal physical damage, uh, you've got well, physical attack. In order to deal... Um, so that's going to be used by your physical arts, um, your seraphic arts, which is basically spells, which are, we are not going to use, are going to use... Uh, I think it's M attack. I'm not sure about the... Um, so hidden arts also use art attack, but we don't use hidden arts for damage. So the only damage we care about is physical. Yeah, so actually... Um, uh, so martial arts are going to use the lowest stat of, them, of, of both of them. So if you've got uh, a low magical attack, that, that is going to use that and instead... Uh, uh, Versa. Yeah. yeah, so for Mystic Arts is like really the interesting one and it's how it does. So each of the uh, different attacks have like a specific one to use, but for Mystic Arts, which we're going to be using for the main damage in the run, it uses your strongest physical damage or your strongest damage stat and then the enemy's weaker um, defense stat. So if you have a lot of physical, which is what we're going to do, 
the MA will always pick your physical stat, and then in the bosses, whichever one they're weaker towards, that's the stat it will use for them. So it's kind of like cheating to give you an advantage with damage on Mystic Arts. The other interesting stat in this game is focus. Just like in this area, it's uh, how fast your soul gorge is going to go back up. So, you know, those little uh, squares. Uh, I believe it's also what affects stun, uh, stun generation as well. So. Yes, I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay, so here, um, we basically met up with some of like the, the underground evil people who are helping us. So we want to get some information out of them, but they told us that they'll only help us if we do some jobs for them. So they give us three tasks to do, and we can do them in any order. The only important thing is that we do the second task they give first. Because at the end of this uh, job, we're going to get the second passive item that increases overworld movement speed. So if we do this earlier on, we're going to get it. We're going to get that increased movement speed for the other two jobs. So it's very important to make sure you pick the second option in, that, in those three options that we got in the cutscene there. And this is where the in-game introduced us to the other type of bottles. Which, you know, first were Denor bottles that lets us leave dungeons instantly. And Enoch bottles are what we're gonna get here. And those let us teleport between any major towns at any point. The unfortunate part is the game introduces us to them here and gives us two bottles, but we can't buy any more bottles until later in the run. So now we have two to work with. We're gonna use them in the two most efficient areas and then we're gonna not have any more for probably another like 30 40 minutes until we can buy more of them yeah this game really likes makes you move around and uh go back and stuff yeah so now um this job that we're doing is basically saving some guy who's been forced to work somewhere so he was kind of kidnapped in a way by the abbey and now we just have to go rescue him and then there's gonna be a fight at the end of it and that fight is what gives us the passive to increase movement speed but yeah, as we're running through this dungeon, because again, dungeons in this game are uninteresting, CC, you could take it over for a couple of minutes. The takeover has begun. Um, Toast Sandwich is donating $5 and testing my uh, voice acting skills. Discord! Ah! <laughs> That's really bad, but thanks, Toast Sandwich. Uh, and $25 from Anonymous with no comments. Um, we are still $1,500 away from the Mystic Art Showcase, and we're also conveniently $1,500 away from 50 k for Nami. So if we meet that Mystic Arts Showcase, we're also going to hit 50 k and this place is going to go insane. Let's do it, chat. I believe. There's some really, really cool Mystic Arts in this game, and uh, a lot of them actually mirrors uh, some of the older ones uh, which is a really cool uh, really cool hint for the for the fans of the series yeah in general th this series is very good at doing like callbacks to older games in forms of either mystic arts or the legacy costumes or also the cameo fights that exist in every game where you fight characters from other games or even arts as well like can we talk about tiger blade for a second <laughs> and how many times it's been in games or good old demon thing yeah Yes, yeah, so a lot of arts are repeat, which is really interesting when you play the whole series and you start seeing the patterns. Yeah, and usually you're like, oh my god, it's Tiger Blade. It's one of the best art in Tales of Symphony. Let's use it. Oh wait, it's bad in this game. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So here there's a lot of teleporting enemies. I don't know if you've been seeing, but they just kind of pop up in front of me and I have to react to them. And this coming up fight is similar to the last fight I did, which I was saying is completely dependent on luck is you want these enemies to stack up. And if they stack up, the spike can end very quickly. Or it could take forever. So I did put all the AI on defense only earlier. But I will be doing like, physical commands and telling them what to do. So in this fight, I want them to attack. So I just kind of do a go all out command. For later fights, I won't do that whenever I don't need them. So it's just easier to control them rather than having them do whatever. Okay, so there's one more guy. Oh, I have no souls. You're wide open. Yeah. You're wide open. Also, whenever I want to do uh, break souls, it's really better to just switch to the character and use it yourself. Because while I do ha have Aizen to use 
his break souls whenever he wants. Most of the times he decides to not use it. So we just switch characters. You can actually switch which character you're controlling at any point. So we just switch to Aizen, use it whenever we get a stun, and then switch back to Velvet. We've done what we came for. Let's get back to the old lady. So now, again, movement speed increased, and actually now I could outfront these guys. So earlier on, you saw me go towards the wall because they were faster than me and they could have caught me, but I hug a wall and then they can't see me anymore. At this point, I can actually outrun uh, every enemy. Reminder that wolves are your friends, and every time you walk onto them, enemies are going to de-aggro you, so... Yay for walls. <laughs> so now we have to keep running back and forth into this town, uh, Logress, to keep picking up more of the missions they assigned to us. So the next one we're going to do is like foiling an ambush, which is again just going to a certain area, killing a few enemies and then coming back. And then for the third one, we're going to have to fight an interesting character that we're going to be seeing a lot, but we'll get there when that happens. And actually, um... After that fight, we just unlocked a new art or two, which I'm going to be assigning to Velvet is... Um, so far, I have... Ooh, that's the wrong request. There we Keep go. Up. So, so far, we uh, I put three of my four lines into one ability, and those will stay. But then we have one of the four lines that is kind of a wild card. We switched to whatever we need at the time. So, we're going to need... Twin Whip and Rising Moon later on, so I'm just gonna put them there from now. And these arts in combination are actually very interesting because the way status ailments work is whenever an enemy has a specific debuff on them, that increases the chance for another stat. Like each debuff buffs the chance to get a specific status ailment, and the debuff that Rising Moon gives increases the chance of Paralyze, and that's or Twin Whip's debuff increases the chance of Paralyze, and then Rising Moon right after it paralyzes. So we're going to be using these two abilities like back-to-back -back as a way to more consistently paralyze enemies. So Paralyze uh, is not going to boost your chance to your the stagger uh, duration of enemies, but it's going to have some interesting properties that we're going to see uh, well later on. Yeah, so now we have to kill a bunch of these uh, like gorilla monkeys. They're just demons that were attacking us. That van over there. And these enemies can actually drop useful weapons for dismantling. So I'm just gonna check the drops here. It did give nothing, unfortunately. The but it, again, done. all the drops are just convenience. They speed up things, but they're never required. Everything's routed to never need any random drops. At least from enemies. There is a specific random drop later on that will determine everything for the run. Yep. So now there's one more request, so of course you have to run back into the town. Yeah, run into the town, pick it up, and then run out of the town again, because that's, again, not here. Yeah, in fact, after we pick it up, that is one of the two times that we use oh. the bottles that we got. So because we have to run all the way back to the docks where we came from, this is one of the best places. Actually, I think the best place to use it. But um, again, I'm going to continue picking up these sparkles. Right now, I'm only looking for bronze scrap. Each bronze scrap I get up to, you know, two means I can skip a chest later on. After I get two, like the third one just becomes useless at this point. But in this next quest, we're gonna have to like burn a warehouse because it has materials in it that we're supposed to get rid of. That warehouse generally has a bronze scrap in it. It's not consistent, but I, at least I find it probably more than 75% of the times there. So this uh, very cool music for this area, I do enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, fun music in this game, not as uh, memorable as uh, previous games, especially Cytheria, but yeah. it's, uh, it's cool. Right. Yeah, Cytheria has Let's some of in. the best themes in the whole series, the in my opinion. Shout out to Goshina. Bronze like Scrap. Red so because I got this Bronze Scrap, I can skip a chest later on that probably takes about 10 seconds to pick up, a little bit less. Eleanor. But first we have to fight Eleanor, which uh, again, looks a little bit unique. I wonder why. So she actually comes with a couple of adds that we have to kill. So generally we kill the adds first and then go after Eleanor. But they are running around a lot, so they're being annoying. I'm gonna get the AI to do stuff. 
out and kill this. Ooh, she actually got paralyzed, so I can combo her for longer now. Because whenever an enemy has a status ailment like paralyzed here, they're more likely to stun. So it should be easy to stun her, except Roku took the stun, and then we're just gonna MA. For some reason, this MA, whenever you do it, the screen freezes for like a couple seconds. I do not know why, but it's 100% consistent in this fight for that to happen. So it looks like the game's about to crash, but it usually doesn't. No worries here. Alright, so now we use the other Denor bottle to get back to the town, and now we completed all our requests. So they're gonna tell us what's going on, because a little bit of lore is the reason we came to this town is to find Artorius, who, you know, is the guy that Velvet wants to kill for revenge. And he is now basically like the leader of the world. Everyone thinks he saved the world, he's called the Shepherd. Everyone loves, everyone loves him, respects him, but we want to kill the good guy. And now we're getting information on where he is and how to get to him from this underground guild. Well. But now that they told us where he is, we want to figure out how to get to him. But they won't tell us that for free, so we have to do one more request. And that is going to be like our next main boss fight. We're going to have to go through another dungeon in a little bit. But uh, on the way there, we're going to have to pick up a bunch of these sparkles. This is probably the best place to look for sparkles in the whole run. Because like that, that was his bronze scrap. So now I've gotten two, so I can just skip another chest later on that saves about six, five, six more seconds. So now I have all the bronze I need, but this area has the chance of spawning an item called the Rough Gemstone. Hell yeah. And the Rough Gemstone is an item that does nothing, but it sells for about 22k gold. This so is, This is a lot of gold. Yeah, it's like all the chests that I've been picking up have been giving me less than a thousand. This one gives 21.7k. So if I get it, it's a very rare drop. You can skip every gold chest for the remainder of the run. So this is one of those like semi-significant time saves if you get lucky for it. But it doesn't usually happen. Oh. Yeah, and the other uh, thing that we're going to be looking out for in this area and then the area right after it is a silver scrap. So we're going to be getting a, a shirt later that is upgraded using silver. And again, silver cannot be bought, at least easily. We can buy it later on, but not in time. So we're going to need random, well, quote unquote, random silver. And it's going to be picking up chests, and the chests for silver are generally far out. So if we get a sparkle with it, it actually saves probably 20 seconds or so. So that's one of the more important pickups to get randomly. And the gimmick for this dungeon is we're in the sewers. And look, the water level drops. supposedly there are any alligators there's alligators. At least that's what the game implies. But there actually are not any alligators. But yeah, since we're in the sewers, there's a lot of water. We're having to drain water by pulling levers and then unlock new areas. It's the game's attempt at a puzzle, but it's really not a puzzle. It's just click a button and then continue on to the next area. It's a puzzle for berserk people. Yeah. I feel like the thing that the game attempts to do more than puzzles is a maze. And mazes are, like, you know, if you know the way to go, it just becomes very uninteresting. <laughs> But uh, like, if you look at the map, there's like many different paths, and only one of them actually leads to the final area. The other lead to either just chests or nothing, or an optional boss somewhere. But we don't really care about anything uh, that isn't a longer way in this run. We never go out of the way more than like a few seconds to pick up something. Yeah, like again, as you could see, we are really already overpowered, so we really don't need that much more. Yeah. And like, if you think we're overpowered now, it's just going to get worse and worse the further we get. <laughs> yeah. So right now we're still not one comboing enemies. Like you saw with Eleanor earlier when I fought her, like she dropped out a couple times. I had to kill the extra adds without one comboing them either. That fight, like the enemies can stack and you could one combo, but it's never guaranteed yet. But relatively soon that's going to change. Yeah, but there's uh, just one more screen in this dungeon, and this is actually the screen that can spawn Silver Scrap. So hopefully if it shows up, it's going to be like next to the wall over there whenever I turn the corner. Just, just, just don't forget just, about the teleport. Yes, and there's another teleporter that we have to grab, similar to the first dungeon where we fought uh, Dial, the lizard. So earlier we picked up the teleporter, and we used it a few minutes later. Here we're gonna pick up this teleporter, and if you forget it, you're not gonna know until like 
three hours from now. And you're gonna get to this dungeon again and realize that you just killed your run. Oh. So it's very important to pick it up there. It happened more than... More than once, at least. It does happen. <laughs> it's one of those things that like every runner has to specifically pay a lot of attention to. So again, I'm gonna be checking all these in this area. Actually, this villa can also spawn rough gemstones. Which we only relatively recently found out, actually. I, at least I hadn't known that until recently. Nope. It's that spawn that can have it. But yeah, um, we fought Eleanor earlier. And we're gonna fight her again, right here. So we're gonna be. That's the guy we're trying to assassinate. But of course, right before we kill him, Eleanor kind of tracked what we're doing and she showed up. So we have to beat her. So on phase two of this fight, we're going to be introduced to a new mechanic that is going to heavily change the way we play a game and allow us to play even more aggressively. And at the same time, we've had Mogilu hanging out with us the whole time, just kind of memeing around because that's what she does. She's now actually in our party, so after this fight we're going to have to do something, but first off, we are going to unequip everything on Mogilu as we do for everyone else, change everyone's titles to something that does a little bit more damage, and then steal Mogilu's equipment because it's actually really good, and put it on Velvet. And in this fight, now we unlock switch blasts which allows you to switch between characters well since we have more characters than we fit in the party now we can switch between characters and that will be significant because every time you switch between a character you get one soul on the character you switch to so if i'm on velvet or if velvet is not in the party and i switch her in she's gonna have four souls instead of three and you know more souls equal more combo so we're gonna be having velvet not in the main party for pretty much the remainder of the run and switch her in at the beginning of each fight. And sometimes switch her more than once. But right now it's, again, another fight where we just have to slowly beat up Eleanor and all the other adds. And unfortunately, there's a lot of them. And these guys can actually all stack up at the beginning and you can one combo this fight. Again, early game fights are very RNG dependent. They can end almost instantaneously. They can take a while. Well, I think that uh, su uh, Switch Blast is uh, a little bit costly because you it, you need to spend one BG every time you need to you want to switch. So you can't do that infinitely. Uh, yep. that, that's kind of limited. But it's still so going to be more than enough in order to do what we need. Yeah. So it's basically like a way to convert BG into souls. And BG can be regenerated by inrests and by break souls. Meanwhile, souls like... The only way to get them is through stuns in a fight, and you know, you go into the fight with three. So we need ways to increase them during the fight, we can't do it outside. So that's the best way, is just switching between different characters, and then getting Velvet to however many souls we need, and then start the combo. Technically, you can also get more souls if you perfect dodge an attack. So if you, yeah. you're going to be hit by an attack and you uh, sidestep or backstep, it, you're going to see a soul that's going to pop somewhere on the battlefield. But that takes forever to actually grab. Yeah. And your allies can actually grab it. So it's really not consistent and slow, too. So do we really don't want to go for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, the only time we did it was way earlier in the prison against the Drake. Because in that fight, we needed to get a combo kill, and you know, getting an extra soul mean longer combo to get a combo kill. Yeah. But um, now we have unlocked Magilu, which means um, what is going to be the character costume for her? Oh no. oh no, I've got good news and bad news over here. Oh no. We had a $100 anonymous donation because they loved Tales of Legacy. So, good news is, Maid and Butler didn't make it. Bad news is, Pirates in last. And then we had another $100 donation to try and snipe the Tales of Legacy donation for high school. But Tales of Legacy wins out by $5. Alright, Tales of Legacy for Mogulu. With the scouts of what that fit is it? I actually don't know. Does anyone know who that is? Oh, yeah, I know. Fort Zexon. Who is it? Arch from uh, Fantasia. Fantasia. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with the older titles of the series, so a lot of the, the legacy costumes, I don't know who they're of. Yes, Wait. So Fantasia is the very first Tales of Games on uh, the SNES, and uh, Arch is a really funny 
a magician uh, who... Yeah, she's just really funny. <laughs> so she's like Magula, is what I'm hearing. Uh, a little less uh, nasty and... Uh... <laughs> well, Magula's not that bad. Well, L Less clowny. Let's, <laughs> l let's put it that way. Uh, but lovable, not so bad. So when I unlocked Magilu, I actually did a couple of things. So as everyone else, I took out all of her equipment. I actually turned off all of her abilities. I don't want her doing anything in fights. The only thing I did is I actually assigned her a manual art, like if you're using her. Because a lot of the times we're going to need the ability Spirit Beads. It procs Fiend Weakness, and we don't have much that procs that, so that is almost necessary. So every time I'm going to need it, I'm actually going to switch to Mogilu. Use that art manually and then switch back to Velvet in like yeah. not a lot of the fights in the remainder of the run. So I think we can go a little bit more in depth about uh, how status effects are progged and how Soul Gorges works uh, in this game. Now that we've got sw uh, Switch Blast. So every time you use a soul, um, you use a soul, yeah, um, you use a break soul. So this is going, giving a soul to, to an enemy. And the more souls the enemy has, the more chances he has to be hit by a stun or a burn or whatever. Um, but the interesting thing is that this is not going to be tied to the amount of souls they actually have, but the amount of uh, souls is in the pool. So if you use off, like, I don't know, five or six break souls, this is going to stack. Uh, even if the enemy was at, uh, already at max soul. Which means that we can actually hit the maximum amount, uh, a guaranteed way to get stuns and uh, burns, etc. Making fight ultra consistent. Also, the beat time. This is actually the only fight in the game where it's like, instead of it being you versus the enemy, it's like a 4v1v1. So we're trying to fight Zavid, but then Aizen is also fighting us and fighting Zavid. So Aizen being an enemy can, can stun Zavid and take the stun from you. Or he can hit you while you're trying to attack Zavid. So this makes the fight like a complete like mess. It all depends on on what Aizen decides to do when you're trying to kill Zavid. And then it also depends on whether Aizen stuns or not. So now Rokuro is nice enough to burn Aizen for us. So that means now I should be able to just combo Aizen until he dies. Because he's burnt. And as we were talking about status elements, when someone has a burn or a paralyze or a slow on them, they're more likely to stun. So we can just keep comboing him that way. And that's I think. So I hope you guys enjoyed this theme. If you want to hear more about it, uh, play Zysteria. Yep. Play Zysteria, maybe watch a certain runner do Zysteria on RPG Limit Break. <laughs> if you're interested in that game as well. It happened uh, in 2019. It's a great run. But yeah, to speak more about status elements, as LGG was mentioning, um, whenever you use a soul on an enemy, if they're on full souls, it puts it in like a hidden pool called the soul pool, and that is what affects status effects. So if you've seen at the beginning of each fight, you probably noticed it, and I'm going to continue doing it, is as soon as I start a fight, I use break souls with all my characters. And that's because it puts more souls in the enemy's soul pool, because they're not doing anything on like the AI characters. So I'd rather those souls be in the enemy's soul pool, so when Velvet is attacking them, they're more likely to stun. So I've started every fight with just dumping the souls with everyone, and later on, I'm gonna actually start using switch blasts, or switches, to get more souls just to dump them. Because the more you dump souls into an enemy, the more they'll stun, and later on, we one-on-one -on -one combo. And it's gonna kinda start soon when we start one-comboing enemies. That requires a lot of souls being in the enemy soul pool. That's really something that no one ever explains to you, and you just have to figure it out by yourself. Yeah. Yeah, as a lot of the mechanics in this game, they either don't explain them at all, or they give you like a small like toolbox that explains something right after the fight. Like right after a random fight, they're like, oh, if you upgrade a weapon, it gives you this additional effect, and then it never mentions it anywhere again. <laughs> so it does a lot of that. That's why this game when playing casually might take a bit to pick up because the game doesn't explain anything. But after you really start understanding things, you realize there's so many mechanics that you could use to your advantage. That, like, if you look at the run, for example, everything one-shots it, and we haven't grinded or... We're not doing anything fancy. It's all just knowing all the mechanics that the game doesn't explain and using them to our advantage. Also, there is something important that I have to mention. 
Your expedition has returned. Thanks. Yeah, so expedition has returned. If you see that ship icon over the in the bottom right, that's going to stay there for the rest of the run. <laughs> Expeditions are completely useless in the run, and we're never going to worry about them again. We only have to pick one expedition up as a tutorial, and it's actually really cool because you pick it up as you get into uh, Port Zexen after, the, after you unlock MAs. And this thing will pop up like, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes, like at a consistent timer after you first um, get the tutorial for the expeditions. So what, the only reason we use expedition is to kind of know how the past 30 minutes have went. <laughs> so if, the, if you get the expedition pop up when you're on this ladder, that means the past 30 minutes have been really good and you're fast. If it pops up where I had it pop up, that means it's uh, not a great, but not horrible run. Like it just, it's a way to gauge how your past 20 to 30 minutes have went. And that's the only reason we use it. <laughs> the only way we can utilize this useless mechanic. Wait, and now we got to this new temple that was built. Uh, it's where Artorius is, supposedly. And we're having to, you know, do a puzzle, which is just clicking two buttons to open a door. And then we can go to the main building and face him there. So once again, this might uh, remind the people who played this area something. Yep, this place might look familiar. <laughs> Just with a blue sky on the on the background. Yeah, instead of red and you know apocalyptic. <laughs> yeah, so this is another point where we'd actually just use a Denor bottle to leave the dungeon and go back in because it is faster than just walking back. We're gonna be doing that in a couple dungeons later, we like exit and go back in, but it's just like one of those things that like we use anything we can to save a little bit of movement because we do so much of it in the run and if you can save 20 seconds by using a bottle, why not? Yeah, so that's um, Artorius' temple that was recently built to worship Inominat, which we haven't talked much about, but it's basically like a god that the Abbey is trying to resurrect. And they're trying to use him to basically achieve their goals, but we don't want them doing so, obviously. And we're gonna know more about Inominat later. I, I don't even think we care about their goal. We just want to kill Artorius. Yeah, so Velvet doesn't... <laughs> like, each one of the party has some sort of beef with the Abbey, all unrelated. He's here. So we kind of all just like, all right, let's hang out because we all have a common enemy. But each of it is for different reasons. But uh, over there, I just grabbed a weapon called the Shell Shredder that is going to be the weapon we're going to use on Velvet for the rest of... almost the rest of the run. Good. Also, this place looks absolutely fantastic with uh, low graphics. If you have no shadows, the floor is actually completely white in this area. This fight, again, is a fight that you can't do anything about. You can't beat him. You can't do anything. You just have to wait about 80 seconds. So, you know, just sit back, put your controller down, and just wait as Artorius tries to attack you. But auto, auto defense in this game is so good that you don't need to worry about dodging attacks. You can just sit back and enjoy it turns out Arturis is too strong for now, and we can't finish the game yet. Yeah, so if we hit him, it's just zero damage. Similar to the wolf at the beginning of the game. But the wolf earlier was about 20 seconds, this guy is about 80. And funnily enough, this is actually the longest break you get in the run. Since you can skip cutscenes, you never get to put the controller down and walk away. This is the only spot you get to. While our party is kind of bad at doing fights, they are, however, really good at dodging. <laughs> there is no reason to. So the only thing is we do soul dumping there at the beginning to get some BG back on Velvet and on Magilu. And anyone who's missing BG, that's the only thing we have to do in this fight. Otherwise, we just wait. First, we've got to get but yeah, so Artorius was too strong. He almost beat us. He almost killed us, but then... I think called an Earth, Earth Pulse Rift opened up, which is a way to get into this Earth Pulse, which is, uh, I don't know, the equivalent of the life stream in other games or whatever, which is, you know, a hidden area in the Earth or something that isn't really explained at all, but we use that to escape away, and Luffy Set is Just now feeling, set. feeling sick because he had to use a lot of power to keep Velvet alive there. And this is where we actually realize that Luffy Set has some like immense powers that we didn't know about. He's actually one of the strongest Malakim in the world. It should be around here somewhere. Hmm. Who would have thought a party member is actually very, very strong? Yeah. 
yeah, as we escape through here, it's really uninteresting. There's no enemies, there's nothing. You just have to run through the different screens with Velvet talking to herself. But uh, I guess as we're running through here, uh, CC, you could take it over for a couple minutes again. All righty. I've got $100 from Doe Wolf by my Mystic Arts. Fall again as wind swept snow. Wait, wrong game. $75 from Acid Fire Boom. Tales of the Soggy Show. I mean, Magilu. <laughs> 2022 from Hooligan. Hello, Lurking. We've been trying to contact you about your walking simulator's extended warranty. <laughs> For the low price of one rough gemstone, you could be upgraded to premium wind stepping. <laughs> Good luck with the rest of the run. And remember, just because I'll be asleep doesn't mean I won't find out if Hellkite bodies you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hooligan is the world record holder of this game in this category, and he has done a lot of the work of routing the current route. Shout out to Hooligan. Yep. And he's also routed Zysteria recently, so he's kind of the, the person overhauling the Tales of series at this point <laughs> in terms of speedruns. Yeah, so now we, um, we escaped through the Earth Pulse. We ended up in this other temple somewhere that we don't know where we are. Uh, so we're trying to escape out of here. That is basically our goal right now. Wait. And so the adventure came to a close in a most sudden and unsatisfying oh, no. manner. Look, that was Oh, the wall's first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I had to let Magula get her line off because Magula is just amazing and we had to let her get her jokes off. Shout out to Magula. So this area I know has three enemies, but I only saw two. That means there was an invisible person. That's going to be common. So you kind of just memorize different rooms always have the same amount of enemies. And if you see less than that, that means there's invisible enemies and you need to be careful. Right, this is Turtles. I'm gonna save because if I mess up this menu, the run will die. Uh, so we're just gonna dismantle everything we have and enhance the Shell Shredder. And enhance. No, that's it. Yes, Shell Shredder is now gonna be the weapon we're gonna be using for the rest of the run. Well, we're gonna switch off of it for a little bit and then get back, but this is probably the strongest weapon that we can reasonably upgrade without it being too expensive. That's why we were collecting all the bronze fra uh, fragments earlier, because this weapon uses bronze, and I needed to have enough to get it to plus three there, and then I'll need to get it to plus five a little bit later when we can go that high, because right now we can't upgrade past plus three. But yeah, a little bit of what's going on is actually when we were in the Earth Pulse, we found Eleanor again, who would have thought? And she helped Luffy, said, because she's an exorcist. She can, like, bind with him and make him less sick. But as we exited the Earth Pulse, she disappeared with Luffy, said, and we're trying to find her because we don't want her taking him away from us. But we have agreed to do a duel between only Velvet and only Eleanor. And if we win, Eleanor is going to follow Velvet's every command, which, you know, obviously we will, and obviously Eleanor will be joining the party after this fight. So if you want to get any donations towards the costumes, do it quickly. Yes. This is going to be your last chance too, because this is our last party member. Yeah. So first we're going to be trying to dodge her to get a soul out. And then try to generate a little bit of stun on her, which actually we didn't talk much about stun generation, but we can do so when we have a little bit more time later. But for now we're just going to start a combo. And it all depends on when she stuns and whether you want combo her or not. Sadly, since we don't have any other characters, we can't switch away for the Discord animation. We have to watch it. She didn't stun there. She could have stunned, and if so, she would have died. But now she's going to get down, which means we can't hit her again. She'll stun here, and we'll just kill her. It's a very simple fight. Eleanor can't do much to you. Right, so now we can actually, we have to talk to Luffy said here. We can Denor Bottle out of the dungeon. It actually took us so long to know that. We've always walked out of it like an extra 20, 30 minute walk, 20, 30 second walk until like we found a random runner do it once and we're like, oh, that's possible. <laughs> so it was just like a very convenient time we save that we randomly found out about a few months ago. Still weak. But um, so now Eleanor will be in our party. We just have to rest. Which, a little thing about rest in this game, a lot of the times you hear the sleeping music, 
it actually is not an in-rest. You don't get regenerated for it. So if it's, if it's a story sleep like here, you actually don't get anything from it. It only plays the audio. You only get BG back if you pay for the sleep, and which we did in here. So here there's just a little menu that we're going to do. Take off everything from Eleanor, steal her uh, equipment, change her strategy because, again, we don't want her doing anything. And we're going to swap her into the party and Velvet out. As I mentioned, we're going to be switching Velvet in the fight in so she can have more souls for the rest of the run. That's always going to be the case, but we had just unlocked Eleanor, so who is winning the final costume? Well, Softnum did not leave a comment on his donation, but in chat he said I had to. He donated ten dollars, and he made high school the winner. We get one high school. This is the only costume that we get, so it's great. Uh, school days, Eleanor. And... I think we had one winner from every category. I believe so. Oh, there's actually multiple. Let's let's just go with the win. Nah, let's go with this one. I didn't realize there were actually multiple uh, school outfits for Eleanor. Alright, so again, thank you for donating towards that uh, bid war. But that was the last one for now. Or for the rest of the run, so... Maybe you can donate for the M.A. For the, uh, for the M.A. Exhibition. Yes. Alright, so this next fight is an enemy that has one soul. We call him One Soul Guy. Which him having one soul means that he should be weak. He can't do long combos. But him having one soul means you can't get souls from him other than just the first one. So you have to do a specific combo on him and hope he stuns. Sometimes he doesn't stun, sometimes he breaks out. But if he does, he's so weak that it takes him forever to kill you to restart the fight. And he can't be stunned again, or it's very hard to stun him again. It would take forever to kill him. So it's like a fight that's supposed to be very simple, like not really a boss fight, but like a mini boss. But it's actually one of the hardest fights in the run. And it's actually one of the biggest run killers. Like it went well there. But if you're watching anyone do PB attempts or something, that fight is dreadful. Always sweating once this guy appears on screen. Yeah. And right after him, there's another boss, uh, Kurugane. So he's gonna be a person that we see more towards Later in the run, he will be like a kind of a party member. We don't play him, but he's always hanging out. So the, the thing about this guy is we need to burn him. And to burn him, we're going to use Magilu to do spirit beads on him. And that will give him a debuff, which if he debuffs, looks like we're just not burning him. So if Magilu gets the debuff on him, he's actually more likely to burn. Oh, there we go. She just did it. A burn is not necessary, but if he burns, we just... We can keep him in a combo. He's actually going to break out. That's because we didn't get a burn. So a lot of the bosses we try to burn, but it's never guaranteed. Unfortunately. And the other thing we're using Magilu for, actually, is to proc weakness on him. So as you see, um, he just got chained from Magilu Spirit Beats. So we use it for like two things at the same time. Unfortunately, we didn't get the debuff, so it was a little bit of a not ideal fight. But again, a lot of the fights earlier on, at least up to here, other than one soul guy, are easily recoverable. Later on, if something doesn't go that way, it's generally going to be a retry the fight. Something that you could see if you pay a little bit of attention is that uh, he, he somehow managed to break out of the combo. That's because... There is one mechanic in this game uh, known as Soul Burst because the devs obviously realized that Velvet was broken and could uh, infinite combo stuff. Um, so that was a way for the developers to um, prevent you from doing one combo and finish the fight. Uh, is that every time a boss is going to hit a certain HP threshold that is completely unique to uh, whatever boss you're fighting, they're going to use an ability called Soul Burst. And once that happens, well, that's not going to do ta that much damage, but this is going to break any kind of combo that is happening right now. Yeah, so most bosses have Soul Burst at either 25%, 50%, or 75% of their health. Sometimes multiple of those, but that boss has it at 50%. So while it is meant to break you from one comboing the enemy, you just two combo them instead. You wait for the Soul Burst, and then you just do the same combo again. 
or if you manage to get an MA in, then you can just destroy, defeat the AHP bar, and there's no soul burst, and you, everyone is happy about it. Yeah. So most fights later, we're gonna actually squeeze us in as big of a combo as we can before the soul burst, and then MA and kill it with that MA, so that way we wouldn't have to sit through the soul bursts. So while it is supposed to stop you from one comboing enemies, it really doesn't for the majority of the fights. Right, so now we're having to run through the dungeon. So what happened there is the Kurigani guy that we just fought is actually a, a demon that is only living to make swords. His whole life purpose is to make sword a sword that's stronger than another specific blade that's the strongest in the world. Since it called a Stormbreaker? Yeah, the Storm... Stormblood? No, Stormquell? Something like that. Anyways, that's... That's... Yeah. that's that's Aizen. Yeah, that's Roker's brother. Not much of this fight. He's dead. I hope you enjoyed this anime because this is the last time you're going to see it. Unless we get more donations towards the MA showcase and we can see more of Roker's amazing MAs. But yeah, so for that fight, MAs are not only strong in Velvet, they are strong in everyone. So we just use... Uh, we stun the enemy there and then we... In fact, every time I MA, we haven't mentioned that, but instead of me doing a Mystic Art, we do what's called the Break Soul Mystic Art, is instead of only pressing the MA button, we do the Break Soul and the MA button at the same time, and that does a Break Soul and an MA at the same time, <laughs> like to put it simply. And what that does it is, whenever we MA, we do it after we stun an enemy because that does double damage. But whenever you stun, you take a soul out of the enemy, but you want the enemy to be at full souls whenever you use an MA because that does more damage. So whenever we do a break soul MA, it actually puts in the soul in the enemy again and then does the MA. So that way it does significantly more damage because, you know, they're at full souls and that makes them take more damage. And that's why that one shot there is because I stunned him, did a break soul MA, used Droker as higher stats, Shigure as lower st as stats, and just one shots. Sadly, uh, the other MAs are not going to scale very well compared to Velvet because we're going to only focus on Velvet's damage. Yeah. So they're going to be pretty worthless later on. But for now, Rokuro still manages to stay uh, stay on touch. Yeah, that's basically the only time we use anyone else's MA because it's a 1v1 between Rokuro and the other guy is his brother. Um, the reason... Well, from now on, the reason Rokuro is going to be hanging out is because he has the goal of killing his brother. And that's why he's going to continue going on, because he just found out that Shigure is part of the Abbey, the same people are fighting. The ship is of course. One more. So it's in the and yeah, so Kurugane is now making Rokuro a blade to basically make Rokuro stronger. He's basically teaming up with Rokuro, because, you know, a swordsman and a swordsmith are becoming friends. And we're just going to have to wait for them. And as we do in JRPGs, we talk to everyone when we wait. Also, shoutouts to Bienfu, the best character in the game. Bad news. <laughs> but yeah, so Bienfu is like a little Norman that Mogilu has kind of forces him to tag along with her. And he told us that there are exorcists coming into the cave to come after us. And that's why he's saying it's bad news. But realistically, it's not that bad news. We're just going to beat them up as we do everyone else. So we're going to start walking out of the cave as we wait for Rokuro to get his, to get his new blades, which we're actually going to equip on Rokuro. Even though we don't use them, it's slightly better than his current weapon, and we're going to dismantle his current weapon. So it is convenient that we just get a free Rokuro weapon, so we can just put it as a placeholder, placeholder on, his, uh, on his main equipment spot. So... We're almost there to the fight. So this fight actually has a slightly interesting mechanic. So there's going to be a bunch of weaker exorcists and then one stronger one. And the stronger one actually has a thing like, I think it's called like soul link to the weaker ones. So as long as he's alive, the weaker ones are buffed so they don't die easily. But after you kill this guy, the other ones get weaker. So we just killed the first guy here. He actually has a soul burst too for some reason. We just stun him, you know. Keep stunning so we can keep break soul and keep the combo, and then these people will just fall over. 
So this mechanic is not used much. It's used in a couple other fights, but generally it's it's very rare that like one enemy buffs the others. It's usually something that you'd see in uh, uh, the mini bosses. I, I can't remember the exact name uh, that yeah. uh, exists throughout the game. Uh, so there is quite a few fights that uh, let you fight tyrants or unique monsters uh, that are going to be like basically mini bosses, and if you beat them, you get a lot of money uh, as a reward. Um, and that's where you're usually going to see uh, this link thing. Yeah. But yeah, we do actually zero optional fights in this run, like because they don't give us good enough rewards to care about going out of our way for them. Yeah, there's just uh, now we got Roker back in the party. He got his new weapons, and we're just kind of going out. And Roker's brother actually didn't just leave us. He told us that he's gonna meet us outside at the docks. And if we want to leave this place, we're going to have to get through him. So the first time we fought him, he was weak. And Drokuro basically 1v1s him. But at this point, he's going to be playing seriously. And we're going to have to do a, a legitimate combo on him with Velvet. He still hopefully should just die in one combo because they all do. But it's not going to be as simple. But yeah, like a little bit of the lore is what's going on is we ended up in this random island after we exited from the what was it called the the Earth Pulse, and Aizen basically sent a carrier pigeon message to the pirate crew to come pick us up from where we are, and now we're just heading to the docks so we can head to our next destination, which is an we're basically looking for one of Magilu's friends to translate a book for us, and that's what we're gonna be trying to head to next. Yes, because we realized that we were not strong enough to defeat uh, Artorius, so instead we're going to try and uh, prevent him from doing his goal and try to find a way to weaken him. Yeah, so he's trying to completely awaken the Enominat god, but we we have a book that Lafayette had that basically talks about Enominat, but it's written in some dead language that none of the party members know. But Magilu has a friend who knows it, so we're going to be trying to go find her now, and that's uh, basically the goals of the party right now. But yeah, this dungeon, again, doesn't have much. You have to light up candles to open doors. The candles are hidden, but you know if you know where they are, it's running straight to them, and that's it. Other than that, just listening to footstep noises, because there's very faint music. I've got some donations if you got some time. Uh, we got about a minute until the next fight. All right, we got $25 from Rango Fett. Roses are red, donations go far. You got Mogilu. Look, a shooting star. <laughs> $20 from Venkalos with no comment. Thank you very much. And $15 from Anonymous. Let's see some artful artistry with Mystic Arts. We are about $1,300 away from the Mystic Art Showcase and 50K. All right, so here we're just grabbing this chest. I think I actually don't need it. I think I got enough bronze scrap, but I'm not completely sure, so I'm just going to grab it for safety. It's very close. And this is Shigure. So now we're going to be doing what we mentioned earlier about soul All dumping right. and Let's switching between characters business. to get more souls. So I'm going to start a Mogulu, switch her to Velvet, and switch back. And switch back. So now Velvet has full souls. We're going to do Discord on him and a Searing Edge to proc weakness. And this way we should be able to just one combo him here. There we go. This is basically how every fight will look. Well, most fights from now on will look like. It's just one combo before the enemy does soul burst. We do MA, it does so much damage and they die. Welcome to Berseria, everyone. Welcome. So this is where the run really starts. Speaking of the run starting, this run is very big in one thing, and it's the like oh, what no. it's the vein of this run and what makes it uh rough to run sometimes is that there is one weapon that we need. It's called the Floric Blade. And the Floric Blade only shows up in shops, and as we mentioned earlier, the contents of the shops are random. 
So that weapon might or might not show up in shops, and it is basically required for the run. And there's two shops where we can get it. The first one is going to be in this town. And if we don't get it in this town, there's one more town later on that we can find it in. And if not, we're going to have to start going for backups. And that is basically, in a normal run, it's a dead run if you don't get it. So you get two hours into the run, the weapon is not in the shop, you kill the run. That's how it goes in Berseria. But for now, we're going to go for an in-rest and, you know... It's for some reason required to show this cutscene in marathons. <laughs> I don't know the lore of it, but every runner in the past has done it, so I have to follow suit. Right. Yeah, so this is the shop here. We're going to be buying a bunch of bottles, and if the blade is there, we'll instantly buy it and we're set. It's not. Nope. So there's two Kalkite blades. We're looking for the Floric blade. So the Floric blade is the rare drop in the shop. So the common one is Kalkai, the rare one is Floric. So we usually don't expect to get it here, but it's very nice if we do. If not, in the next shop, the Floric Blade is the common drop. So it's not too bad that we haven't gotten it yet. We don't expect to get it here, but... Again, it's something that we're going to have to keep in mind for later in the run, where if we don't find it, we're going to have to start going for a bunch of backups. So, lore-wise, we got stopped in our tracks because, well, the crew is uh, becoming sick and we gotta find some cure for them, and that cure is in this very specific forest that uh, we landed next to. Yeah, so the reason we stopped in this town is because the medicine for that, for that disease is common around this area, but then the pharmacist said he doesn't have it, and that the abbey has completely locked out this forest that has the plant that makes the medicine so he's not allowed to go but obviously we don't care about what they say we're gonna go ourselves and grab that that herb so they can make this the medicine the so it's just a a big careful. detour away from our main goal that we were mentioning earlier of figuring out where magulu's friend is to translate the book for us to figure out how we can beat inomina and artorias also, puzzle movement with these uh, switches that are really simple again. Yeah, so this one is... Earlier it was like, you know, you click the switch, the door opens. This one has like, it switches doors, so every time you click one, it closes the door but opens another door. Not really too complicated either. Yeah, it's not. So in terms of a run, again, it doesn't change much. It's always run in the same way, click the same buttons, you'll get there. But yeah, so to talk a little bit more about the combos, so the reason earlier on in the fight against Shigure, you saw me switch between Mogulo and Velvet multiple times. So that's for two reasons. One, to get more souls on Velvet for the combo. And then the second one is to get more souls on Mogulo that she can dump. So, you know, it's not only to give Velvet more souls, but to give other characters souls that you can use. And that's why uh, Shigure was stunning quickly, is because, as we mentioned earlier, there's the soul pool that's a hidden value of how many souls the enemies have. And the reason he was stunning so quickly is because we basically filled it up. Well, we didn't completely fill it up, but we put a lot in it to where he's going to stun every roughly three arts, and we can do three arts in a combo. So he's just going to keep getting perma-stunned. And in this dungeon, there's really nothing. We have to grab a couple of chests. This coming up one will be a Floric Fragment. As, as I mentioned, the Floric Blade is what we're going to be using. So we're going to need a bunch of Floric to upgrade it. So this is one place to get it. And then the rest of it is actually... Eleanor came with a bunch of Floric equipment on her. So whenever we unequipped her, we're going to have those waiting to be dismantled later. And then the other thing that we're going to be grabbing within this dungeon is silver, is because the, the body piece that we're going to use on Velvet that will unlock before the next, not in this boss, but in the next boss, it's going to be like a shirt that usually has defensive stats, but there is one shirt for Velvet that is that has attack and focus, which are two, are two best stats. So we're going to be putting that for the rest of the run, and we're trying to gather as many fragments to upgrade that shirt as we can. It's going to mean that you don't that we have even less defense on velvet but honestly who cares about defense when you cannot die yeah exactly in fact later on like we're going to be wanting to go to low health so like our defense stat is low enough that it doesn't make a difference but <laughs> technically the lower the defense the better basic rule of thumb 
We just have to loop around. There's actually gonna be a chest that has Geld in it. We still need to buy a bunch of, uh... That's a bad spot. Oh. oh. Also, some costumes actually have music attached to them. And I don't know which costume we have, but it changed the music for this battle. Well, it, it's obviously the Tales of Fantasia theme. Yeah. It's because you've got, you know, Arch. Yeah. Pretty good stuff. Play Tales of Fantasia, guys. It's a, it's a, it's a good game. It really holds up, even up to, up to these days. It's actually over there when I saw that enemy almost got up to me. I, I, tr I wanted to quick save and then load because whenever you quick save and load, the enemies go back to their default positions. So if you're about to get caught, you can actually do that to not get an encounter. I just for some reason thought I could outrun this guy when I couldn't. It looked like you could. Yeah, I think it's because I wanted to turn back for the chest and I was kind of making a decision. Do I want to just forget about the chest or do I want to turn back yeah, for yeah. it? So I ended up running back into him. <laughs> But it doesn't matter. We lost the tutorial, which can help us for later, but we still have like like four or five tutorials. It's not really a problem. These fights, these guys are weak. They just die. They're wide open. They're wide open. Yeah. So that's, you know, not surprisingly, they're not the boss. There's going to be a boss in the next screen with the actual enemy of this area. Is uh, gonna be like, I would say the first boss that really showcases exactly how combos will be. Because while Shigure kind of did it there, but Shigure only switched Mogilu and only dumped Mogilu. While for the next fight, I'm gonna be dumping Mo uh, Mogilu's souls twice and then everyone else at the same time. So when I first get into the battle, it's gonna look like a mess of me just switching between characters so quickly and just using every ability. Thankfully, uh, I'm pretty sure you can uh, switch and keep the um, uh, break soul button on so you don't have to actually just jiggle around your buttons. You can just hold it and it's going to be fun. I usually just toggle, actually. Really? <laughs> I'm just used to doing that, but yeah, like you can... <laughs> That's, uh, that sounds weird. <laughs> A lot of it just goes down to like what you knew and didn't know when you learned to run. <laughs> yeah. So this is right the plan now. that we want, and obviously as soon as we pick it up, a big bug is gonna attack us. Alright, so here we're gonna wait for him to attack, start a combo on him, and then we're gonna do twin whip, proc chain, and then just combo him down until he's low enough HP to wear a Break Soul with kill, or a Mystic Art with kill. There we go, this should be enough. He has 24k HP, we do 24k. A lot of the combos are routed to be as short as you can, while still reaching however much HP the enemy does, or enemy has, and for this one it works out very conveniently, or if you do this combo you'll kill him almost exactly with the amount of HP the, the bug has. Yeah, it's something that we didn't really talk about, but basically since we know that you can one combo every enemy, obviously that means that every bosses are routed in order to have a very, very specific combo to know that it's going to be the most optimal way to kill. And so you just have to execute the combo and you win. Yeah, so from here on out, it, it was a little different in the beginning parts of the run where we didn't have specific combos. It was just react to what the enemy is doing when you get the stuns. It's more luck. But from here, for almost every fight in the run, I believe it, not quite every fight, but almost every fight, it's a very set combo where if you do the exact combo, they will die. If you mess up the combo even slightly, you will drop the combo and the fight is done. You just have to retry. Yeah, there's probably a few backups here and there if you realize you mess up in, uh, in the middle, but yeah. most of the time, if you mess up, it's because you just misremember the combo or like th thought of another boss and yeah. uh, it screwed up the thing. Because like every boss has a different combo to it. It's not like it's always going to be a little bit, a uh, little variant between uh, every bosses. So that's really the difficulty of this run. Earlier on, like it's kind of similar where you proc chain with which whichever weaknesses the enemy has and then just do gouging spin, harsh rebuttal until the enemy is low enough and your combo is long enough for combo artist. Because remember, we have the title that does more damage the longer the combo. But later on, it's going to be more specific combos that you actually just cannot vary from. 
Also, one thing about this game is you have the bottles that let you teleport. Yeah. But if there's a cutscene between where you are and where you're teleporting to it, the game doesn't allow you to go there. So when I was leaving the dungeon, I actually just had to walk almost the entire dungeon to trigger a cutscene. And then I could teleport out. And then when I'm trying to go to this town again, I had to walk a bunch to find a cutscene and then teleport to it. And that's going to pretty much happen every time we want to use a bottle to teleport. There's always a cutscene somewhere in the middle. Yeah, this game is really inconvenient with, uh, with the movement. You could boost and go so much faster if, if you could skip some cutscenes and stuff. Right, so what's going on here is we got the medicine, we gave it to the crew, but as we were coming back, uh, Aizen found Zavid. And Zavid was basically messing with Aizen and they started... They didn't start a fight, but they're basically starting a fight and Aizen ran after him. So now we have to go find Aizen, help him from whatever is going on. Which, again, you know, another detour from our main goal. Yeah, so a little bit of lore uh, about Zavid. Like, Zavid uh, used, uh, is a Seraph uh, who used to have a wife. And there is a thing with Seraph is that if there is too much malevolence around, so malevolence is basically just evil stuff, evil thought, and etc., etc. If there is too, many, too much evil around them, uh, they turn into a dragon. Uh, and there is no turning back, so you have to kill the dragon if uh, that ever happened. Yeah. So it's the same with demons. All the demons are, which... We, the party actually doesn't know yet. Most of them don't, some of them do. But Velvet doesn't know. Is like, most demons are actually just people who are exposed to malevolence, which is just, you know, evil thoughts. And that's how so many people that, like, you run across turn into demons. It's just because of that. So the reason why the shepherd is so light is because uh, they are the only ones who can purify it. Uh, wait, no, that's no, that's, you, that's just the theory. You can't purify yet, yeah. Yeah, in this game you can't so purify. The shepherd is the only one, no, well, him and the people he gives powers to can fight the demons. Like, if you remember at the very beginning of the game, there was the one wolf that we couldn't do damage to. is because we didn't have powers to fight demons. But then the Shepherd basically gave people power to fight demons, and that's why the Exorcists exist, is because of him. So people think that, you know, Artorias saved the world by giving them a chance to fight the demons. But really, we are just killing other humans who turn kind of bad because they yep. had too much bad thoughts in them. And instead of helping them, we're killing them, and that's really not good. Yep. So we'll try to uh, change that and make the world better, a better place. So we don't really know that yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as far as like the characters know, is that it's actually a disease called demon blight, and when they get that disease, it's it's what turns them into it. They don't know that it's related to like the evil in their hearts that's turning them into it. And they also think it's like a contagious disease. So because whenever it happens somewhere where people get demon blight, everyone in that area gets it. But it's more so because there's a lot of malevolence in that area that just does it to all everyone in the area. Yeah, it's all, it all relates to whatever is explained as well in uh, this area because in this area, well, uh, you're just a shepherd and you're just trying to purify people and yeah, help them. Yeah, so in this area, we can actually turn demons back to humans or in the game, it's called Hellions because different language. But at this point, you can't. Like, when someone is a demon, they're gone. So that's why they justify killing them because they think it's just they're too far gone to be saved. So here we're gonna grab this chest. There's a funny fight up there. It's a great fight. First, there is gonna be a quick menu that I have to do. So again, oh, giving people just their best arts. Oh, I forgot Aizen's. There we go. Change people's equipment. We just picked up the garish pink shirt for Velvet. That is the best shirt that we were talking about earlier. So we're gonna equip that. Give uh, Luffy, Aizen, and Rokuro their best arts for this fight because this fight doesn't have a combo. This fight has three wyverns that you just have to beat up, and we want them doing useful stuff. So, first, we're just again gonna dump souls so they can get stunned faster, and then I'm gonna do attack command and wait for Rokuro to attack one of the wyverns. And then I'm gonna attack the same wyvern that he's attacking because he actually puts a debuff on them that makes them weaker, like, it just makes us kill them faster.
I actually have the wrong art on Aizen, but it doesn't matter. It's like it's holding the right, yeah. What matters is Roker's art, because we have the art on him that gives a physical debuff to the enemies. But yeah, the reason this fight is really interesting is as you see right now, I'm killing basically one Wyvern at a time. These Wyverns can stack up, and you can kill them all simultaneously. But that just requires you getting lucky with the enemy eye lining up, similar to the fight we did earlier in the fortress of enemies just stacking up. They didn't hear. It actually wasn't the worst. No, so that they, was pretty good. So the in-game timer for clearing that fight now was 42 seconds. We generally look for like about 40. But it could go down to less than 20 seconds Where if the, the enemies they just cooperate. They can't have gotten far. Yeah, what happened there is basically we found another one of the Abbey Legates, as they call themselves, uh, Melchior. And he basically got these Wyverns to attack us. And at the same time, he was trying to steal a weapon from Zavid. And the reason Zav Aizen ran after Zavid is that Zavid had a weapon that the guy that Aizen is looking for, the captain of his pirate ship who's gone missing, it was his weapon and now Zavid has it. So Aizen is like thinking that Zavid either killed him or knows where he is and that's why he ran after him. And that weapon is a weapon that basically makes... I don't know exactly what it does, but it makes I Malakim it, stronger and demons yeah. weaker or something like that. I think it boosts your power, yeah. So yeah. you lose Siegfried. Which is, again, is something that if you play Zestiria, you're going to know more about it and why it's a very significant thing. So this cutscene is actually really annoying. If the horse on the right wasn't here, we can walk around the trigger for this cutscene. But since it's there, we have to watch this cutscene. And this cutscene unlocks a class 4 island, which means now every time we try to tell, go anywhere on the ship, there's going to be the option to go to the class 4 island. So it's just inconvenient. A class 4 island is... Uh... A side quest that we really don't have to do because it's a side quest. So earlier I was talking about the Floric Blade and how necessary it is. This is the town where we can find it. So I'm going to do a quick save here as my first backup if I needed it. Here's but, a little time. Yeah, so this is now we're at uh, the beach area, the beach continent. And this is where supposedly Mogilu's friend that we've been looking for for so long is. And that's what we're going to be looking for. But first off, we're going to have to go to the shop. And if it's not there, I'm going to reload that save that I just made. Yeah, and don't worry, there is no beach episode here. We are... Uh, yeah, thankfully there is not. Demons. Yeah, we're, we're evil. We're not having a good time. <laughs> but we will have a good time if the weapon is in the shop, so... This is basically the deciding point of the run. If it is there, we are set for the rest of the run. If it's not, we're going to have to start scrambling around. It's not. We got the rare drop, the <laughs> Amphibla Blade. So I'm going to load this quick save. That's, uh, that's too bad. And the first backup that I'm going to do is Shambaloon. Ooh. So the way that shops work in this game is every time you do three battles, the shop resets. And these fights, like these mini games, counts as a fight. So I'm going to do this three times and then go back to the shop and hope that the weapon is there the second time I go. Come on, really? That was two. There we go. And that was so slower than the other attempt. Uh -huh. Let's play again. No, I don't want to play again. <laughs> now we've got the Norman hat. You know, since we got the Norman hat, we'll keep the maid costume, obviously, because people donated for it. But let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This That's is kind of the, the hat of shame that you put in when you have to do this backup, sadly. <laughs> This is going to look amazing on the MAs. Oh yeah, and the MAs just still gonna have this hat on and it's perfect. <laughs> Alright, so now I'm gonna check this shop again. And if it's not here, since I did three battles, the other shop that could have it also reset. So I'm gonna go there next if the weapon is not here. It, it is, perfect. Okay, the flooring blade is here, we're set. Oh, uh, it is. Did all that just to have the Norman head, really? This is, uh... And at the same time, I also bought two more Floric items, so I can upgrade this to plus three. We're gonna upgrade these to plus one, and then this to plus two. And now we're set. 
So now the shirt that we have on was upgraded to plus two. That is our final shirt. Our, our belt is almost at its final form. And as soon as we get um, back to the Shell Shredder, it's going to be our final equipment set on Velvet, basically, except for the boots. So, you know, we're halfway through the run and we're already at almost end game equipment. So what's so good about this flooring blade, you might be wondering? Well, something we never looked at uh, up until now is that every weapon that you equip has some specific skills linked to them. And uh, you can, uh, as long as you've got those ep uh, ep weapons or armors equipped, uh, you can learn them. The better you do the fight, the, more, the, the better you're going to, to learn those skills. And that's going to be some passive that's not going to stay with you and give you some bonus during fights. And what's so good about Flooring Blade is that when you are under 8% HP, you're going to get an attack bonus of 30%, if I recall correctly. Yes, 30% more uh, physical damage. And obviously, this is uh, very, very good. Yep, so this is actually how the combos would look. I know I've said that multiple times, but I kind of forgot about this one. Is I'm going to break soul the enemy. And as we mentioned earlier, Velvet can't die, and we want her to be below 8% HP. So it's very convenient for her to go to 1%. So now we have a 30% damage increase on Velvet. And we're just going to combo this guy down. Just have to count the current amount of uh, soul voices here. Oh, that's not enough damage. What am I missing? Oh, I didn't equip the Floric Blade. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're just gonna retry this fight. You know, we're yeah. talking about so much about needing the weapon, and then we don't equip it. This is a bonus, and, uh... and yeah. so if you see, this is what happens. Look at how much HP he has left when the weapon is not equipped. And whenever I retry this fight, when he kills me, you'll see that he's gonna. Oh, he's shy. I didn't realize he could turn red. <laughs> yeah. so... All right, so let's actually equip the weapon that we want, and everything is good. There we go. Let's do the combo one more time. So worth noting that oh. we also, the calcite boot that we have um, also give uh, eight percent uh, one under eight percent HP is going to give a thirty percent boost on the uh, focus this side. Focus. So we have two buffs that we get when we get to below eight percent HP. And this should kill him. That's how much the damage. So earlier, each attack of my MA was doing about 3k damage. Now we did about 5 to 6k. Because again, as we mentioned, it is a 30% damage increase, but everything is multiplicative. That includes the combo artist. Break Souls, actually, we didn't talk about it much, but every time you do a Break Soul, you get an extra damage multiplier on Velvet for the rest of the combo. But there's actually like a, a little tweak to it. So you get a certain amount of extra damage for every break soul, but when you get to eight break souls, you start getting less um, extra damage per single break soul in the combo. So if you do seven break souls, let's say you get about 100% damage increase. When you do the eighth one specifically, your extra damage goes down to about 50%, like at about half of what it was. So it's very important that any combo does not go past like more than seven, so it never reaches eight break souls in a combo because that will completely ruin all your damage. Like you would lose almost fifty percent of your damage or something just because you did an extra break soul. So, she was, you can so basically, we have we are limited to the amount of uh, multiplier we can get on the, on a combo before the MA, uh, which is going to be relevant. Uh, well, I think it was relevant on this boss fight. Yes, yeah, so it's this... going to be relevant for another boss yeah. fight. So for this boss fight, it's not. Worrisome because you generally just don't get anywhere near close enough. But for later boss fights, like we do exactly enough break souls that if you do just one more, like for this one, you usually have one extra leeway. Like you can go to seven, but you could get away with only six break souls. But for later fights, it actually gets to the point where one extra break soul and it's gone. So here again, there was an inrest music. We didn't actually pay for the end, so we're not getting anything here. And feebly fragment. I'm gonna grab that because it's gonna upgrade my ring later on. 
But while we are here, this is actually one oh, of the longest boy. walking parts in the entire run. We have probably about 5 to 10 minutes where you could take over at CC. There's nothing going on for this part of the run, so take it over and go as long as you need to. Every time I see this. Oh boy, <laughs> 5 to 10 minutes. All right, well, we're going to keep the Norman head on for uh, just RNG purposes. Um, we are still $1,300 away from the Mystic Art Showcase, $1,300 uh, $1, away from 50 k If you donate right now, you can win some prizes. We have a Persona 25th Anniversary Bag, $5 minimum donation. We'll help you out with that. $15 minimum dollar donation. We'll get an SMT Nocturne prize pack. There was a hat in there. There were pins in there. There was a mug in there. There was a poster in there. Oh, man. There was so much stuff in there. Just a reminder, RPG Limit Break 2022 is coming to you from Salt Lake City, Utah. We are raising money for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness which was formed in 1979 as a grassroots advocacy organization by a group of parents whose children suffered with serious mental illnesses. And NAMI has maintained that focus to this day. We also have t-shirts from the Yeti. That's Y-E-T-E-E, -E -E, theyeti.com slash R-P-G-L-B. The Yeti is donating $5 for every t-shirt sold. We want to send out a thanks to the people involved in our foreign language restreams. Our French restream can be found at twitch.tv slash le French restream and our Japanese stream at twitch.tv slash Japanese underscore restream. If those restreams can help you enjoy the marathon, go check them out and send them some love. RPG Limit Break is grateful to LLK, a longtime contributor to GDQ marathons and the designer of our promo banners, attendee badges and emotes. Check out her work at Jazaboo, that's J-A-Z-A-A-B-O-O dot com. Another artist that deserves special thanks is the one that worked on our overlays, Oro, who can be found on Twitter at OroLen. We also want to show some love for more community artists. Carrie Fry, who designed the RPG Limit Break logo. And Mega Weasel and It's Casa, who are responsible for some of the emotes that you can gain access to by subscribing to the channel. All revenue from subs and the ads we run will help us run future RPG Limit Break marathons. But fret not, 100% of all donations go straight to Nami. Shout out to the French stream. Uh, you guys are awesome. You're doing an awesome job. And uh, I'm glad you managed to actually find people for the FF7 uh, remaster race. Because, like, <laughs> I, I noticed them. And, like, I, I saw the message, like, uh, posted on uh, on Discord and Twitter. And I, I contacted them, did them. And they were like, oh, wait. We don't know about that. Okay, we need to find people. And it was at 2 a.m. They managed to actually find, like, two people to actually accommodate for this race. So... They've got some really, really great people up, uh, up there. So, good job. And Gardez la Pêche! We probably have another, like, three or so minutes before we can, uh, maybe two to three minutes before we can take it over again. In the direction of the temple. I mean, I could just talk about my love for the Norman head that you're wearing right now. It is great. I should walk backwards. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. But yeah, I guess uh, if we have some time, we can explore, explain more about the lore that's going on now. So we did find Grimoire, who was Mangalu's friend that we were searching for. And she told us that the book that we're looking for has some missing pages. It's actually a copy, and it doesn't have everything that we need in it. So we can't really figure out all that we know. But she also said that she hasn't translated the whole book yet because it's very difficult and we're... As we're waiting, we're going to this temple where we know that there's another one of like the enemies that we're looking for. So we know that there are exorcists here, and we basically have to go to this dungeon. Because as an example of 
the bug earlier that we found, that was an enemy called Ethereum. And Therian are basically demons that feed on other demons to empower a Nominat. The bug that we killed earlier was one of them. We know that there's another one in this in this dungeon and that's why we're here. So our goal at this point is to kill all the Therians so we can weaken a Nominat who is getting his power from them. But wait, Ethereum, that reminds me of something we've heard about until now. Yep. Therion mode? No. Therion eyes? Red Velvet? Uh, uh, yeah. I, yeah. And Velvet is devouring demons? Uh, no, it, it's okay. Yeah, the, the party is not worrying about that yet, but you know, because <laughs> it hasn't occurred to them that Velvet is actually one of those Therians that we were looking for all along, and we didn't realize that it was her until later on. We're like, oh, that's why Ceres helped us earlier, is because she was doing what we're trying to do now. Just, you know, at the very beginning of the game, but she died, so we never really figured any of that out. So it took us about, you know, two hours to... Two hours of the run, and, you know, in the game, it's like the half of the game to really figure out what your goal is. Yeah, but basically, uh, you also realized that at the very start of the game, when uh, Artorius uh, sacrificed Lafayette, uh, he also turned uh, Velvet into a demon. Really just manipulating everyone in his family in order to achieve his goal. Yep. Um, really not a cool guy. Right. So here there's a mini boss. So basically the Therian that we're looking for... We heard in that village that we were in that there was a girl and her mom that went, met, went missing. Basically, the Abbey took the girl, the little girl, and turned her into a Therian. And then her mom was going to help her to find her. And that's who the mom is. She turned into a demon. And then they turned the other little girl into a Therian. So again, they're not good people. They're basically using anyone to to reach their goal, even if it's little kids or parents who are trying to help their children. But this mini boss doesn't have any soul bursts. It's easy to get proc chain on them, so you just kind of one combo them. Unlike the next boss, which is actually one of the one of the bosses that can actually sometimes just troll you. But yeah, this is actually this dungeon is pretty much the only dungeon in the game that actually has a puzzle. So there's a door that you can only open if you turn on all seven like of these chalices. And you have to find a way to get to all seven of them without actually closing their way. Because every time you turn one of these ones on, it turns a waterfall that blocks your path. So you just need to figure out a way to turn them all on without blocking yourself out of others, which it really comes down to being really simple, is kind of going all the way to the furthest one and then walking, working backwards. But in a run where you're not sure what you're supposed to do, this is like the only time in the game where you have to maybe think a little bit yep. in, ter in terms of dungeon design. And get lost a little bit. Yep. Move around in circle with this amazing movement speed. Um, yep. I wish there was a game in the Tale of series that allowed that allowed you to move a um, like, lot like more here. faster. Yeah. Um, and we've been talking about it a lot, but Zestiria. <laughs> my boy. It's a it's a very cool run where you can actually run at crazy speeds. It's really rough going going from Zestiria to this game. Yeah. Because you're like you're moving super fast. On top of that, keyboard allows you to move even faster, and uh, and then you go to this game and you're like, oh, this is going to be long. So here, this chalice here actually doesn't have a button on it. Conveniently, it's right behind it. There's a wall to break. Mm -hmm. And that unlocks this one. And that only leaves one thing. And if you remember, before the mini-boss, there was a waterfall in front of me. I had to turn it off so I could pass through. And now I have to go back and find a way to activate it. Conveniently enough, there's a teleporter that gets me from back here to the front of the dungeon again. That we're just going to use to go back unlock the door, and then come back. Yeah, that can actually take a, bit, a little bit. I remember it took me a little bit to figure this out. Yeah. Actually, when I was doing casual, the thing that I struggled with the most is I didn't see the cracked wall behind that one chalice. Oh. So I was, like, <laughs> running around the whole dungeon for, like, an hour trying to find out how to <laughs> activate it. So this is the last one. If I did everything correctly, there should be a text box. Yep. So now we can just actually proceed to where the boss is at the very end of the dungeon. We just have to, again, 
pre-track the steps. So for this next boss, it's basically going to be the same as the, the big lizard, the poison toad, whatever we call them, the dragon. It's not a dragon, but a lot of people claimed it is. But it's going to be the same, where we use Break Soul, try to get to 1 HP to get all the buffs, and then actually start the combo right after that. But for this one, we actually need to go to 1 HP because it does Break Boost, which is the ability that procs one of the weaknesses that this boss has. So it's actually a tree with a person in it. It's, it's the big scary boss. Ooh, Magula is 27 health. Magula is actually required for this fight. We need Spirit Beads to unlock um, Chain on this enemy. So if she had died there, it would have been... It would have been bad, but not bad enough to kill their run. And there we go. So for this boss, the combo is basically get him to about 15k damage dealt in a combo when then Mystic Art. Because for some enemies, like, the stun timing is a little bit different, so you don't do the exact same thing every time, you just do the about the same thing until you reach however much HP the enemy needs to be at so you can actually kill them. Thank god the end of bubble exists. Yep. So this area doesn't have cutscenes between where you're going and where you are. So conveniently, you can actually just teleport all the way back here. But on the way back, we're going to have to stop by an inn because, again, all the inrests that we thought we've been getting actually don't regen our BG. But now we've done many bosses in a row without it. So we're just out of BG. So at this point, we have to take an inrest to regen everything. Oh, yeah. Back the way you got time in. for donos while you're uh, uh, resting in the inn? We have a minute or two. Uh, thanks. We've got $25 from Grumpy Tiger. Let's get that 50k. We've got $15 from Jetboy the Mage. Let's get to 50k. $5 from Igoin with no comment. Thank you very much. And $25 from Carbon Drank. Good luck, Lurk. Glad to see you running Brasaria. Switching out Eleanor and doing your best bobblehead impression. May the rest of your run be incredible. You might break my soul, but you can't break my heart. Don't be a hooligan. Make sure to love one another. Hug your brothers and sisters and lethal pain. Thank you so much, Carbon, for the donation. Yeah, so uh, a little bit of lore here. Um, the village that we were at earlier, everyone turned into demons in it. Who would have thought that that's kind of... Uh, Whenever the Abbey started kidnapping people from it, people started turning evil. The church is bad. Yeah. And uh, basically what happened is that after everyone turned into demons, Velvet was like, all right, explain to me why everyone's turning into demons. And that's where Aizen, who knows everything about the world and how it works, explains to the party that it's not really a disease, it's just malevolence, people being evil, turning into demons. And that's where the whole party has like a, you know, shock phase of like, oh, that's what it's been all along. And apparently it was like taboo to ever speak of it and Aizen like broke a huge taboo by telling us. But again, he's a pirate, he doesn't care. Edgy pirates. Right, so, and then here, um, the same people that were helping us way earlier in the run told us that they have a mission for us. Uh, let's do this, whatever, okay. Um, so we were basically told to help escort this guy out of town and hide him somewhere. We don't know who he is, but it turns out to be like the prince of this big city. And he doesn't believe in the abbey at all. He doesn't like what they're doing. He realizes they're evil. So he's just trying to get away because he doesn't want to be a part of it. And he's got uh, a cool um, Hulk with him. And turns out this, uh, this Hulk actually turned into a, a Therian. Yeah, the Hulk was one of the Therians, yep. I believe. And so we're starting to have quite a few Therians in our party, so we decide, you know, we should probably find a place for them, because staying on the boat is probably not a good idea. So we are going back to Titania, our good old prison where Velvet was uh, uh, was put in. Yep. So when, um, when we were in the prison way earlier, Velvet basically started a riot, told everyone to get out of their cells, try to escape, and like, you know, to not accept being prisoners. And then everyone broke out. 
And because a lot of evil was going on, all of them basically turned into demons. And now this whole prison is overfilled with demons. With I imagine it's emanating from all the big old demons. Yeah, there we go. Out. Thank you, Magula. But yeah, so before we can make this a safe spot as like a hideout, we have to kill all the demons. We heard that there is a headless demon that's kind of running this place. So we're trying to find him. Of course, it's going to require us to run to the very end of the dungeon. And if you remember earlier, we mentioned that there were... That Velvet was a Therian, and she was being held here. And that's not a coincidence. It's because that's one of the places they were holding Therians. They were kind of putting them along every Earth Pulse point, which are, you know, similar to the area that we escaped from earlier at the, at the big temple. They were putting one at each point, and then they could use the Earth Pulse to feed Enomina power. And Velvet was the one in this area, basically just giving Enomina power, and she doesn't know it. And that's where she finds out and gets even more angry, because, you know, Velvet wasn't angry enough in the first place. She gets more mad about, like, how she was being used to power up this evil god. Yeah. Velvet angry and uh, even more angry. And that's not going to stop. <laughs> there we go. So that's supposedly the headless demon that we're worried about. But as we fight him here, you're going to realize that he's not that strong. So something interesting about uh, Paul is this, oh, oh well, undead. Uh, enemies is that every time you deal damage to an undead, undead enemy is going to regen some of that damage that uh, he's dealt to it after after he, he take damage, unless they've got paralysis status on. So that's why we're going for the paralysis uh, combo here. And this is going to be interesting for the next boss fight because turns out this was not the actual boss of the dungeon. So we were hearing about a headless knight. And then that was a headless person, but he's not the headless knight that we're worried about because there's still malevolence in the area. So we're going to have to go find the actual headless knight, which is going to be back at the beginning of the dungeon where we came from. So we have to walk back. And uh, yeah, this uh, looks very similar to what we did already at the very beginning of the game. And yeah, I hope you liked playing it. Yep. So this the same route I'm walking, we're going to be walking a lot later. <laughs> This place is now our HQ. Yep. The pirate hideout. Yeah, to touch a little bit on what we were mentioning about paralyzed and undead enemies. So, undead enemy right there, we used the twin whip rising wound combo that I talked about earlier, how twin whip increases the chance to paralyze and then rising wound right after it almost always paralyzes. And like, if the enemy is stunned, it should always paralyze. The next enemy has a very quick recovery time, and twin whip is a slow ability. It takes a while, like it's, it does one hit, pauses, does another hit. And with the quick recovery time of the next boss, he will break out of the combo during that downtime. So we can't use Twin Wave to paralyze him, but we still need to paralyze him, or else he's going to heal all the damage we do to him. So that's where we're going to have to use Rokuro to use another ability that help us, helps us uh, paralyze. But having to use Rokuro means Rokuro has to do something correctly. So first I'm going to go to down 1 HP, and I'm going to do Concealed Blade and switch to Roker so he does it. Okay, so he landed his his debuff. So what Roker can do there is actually multiple things. So he can completely miss the ability. Like he does it, but he doesn't hit the enemy. Or the other thing he can do is steal the stun. And if he takes the stun, Velvet doesn't get the soul. He gets it. So we can't actually continue the combo. And the third thing he can do is hit the ability and sometimes not get the debuff on. That's very rare, but... Hey. So that fight in actual attempts is similar to the one soul guy that we talked about earlier. It's like one of those fights that as soon as you get to, you get worried. You start sweating because this fight has killed so many runs by just Rokuro not cooperating. Yeah, again, uh, in this game is uh, not really good at hitting or doing what we want them to do, but they're good at dodging. Yeah, that's about it. So here I'm gonna modify Velvet's arts a little bit. This is the Shadow Flow, this is the Water Snake, this is Swallow Dance. So we don't need to do any more paralysis stuff 
uh, Swords are run, so that's why we can remove that. Yeah, and we just unlock Shadow Flow, which is a very good ability. It procs a lot of the weaknesses we couldn't proc earlier, and it also gives the physical damage down on enemies. So earlier I was using Rokuro to do that. Now I can just do it with Velvet, so I don't I have to worry about Rokuro even less. But again, we have to climb a lot of ladders, and we have to run around Titania a lot because now that it's our base, we're gonna be here a lot. And again, in rest. But we didn't pay, so we're not actually getting an interest. I... And now it's time to uh, to go back to where Velvet was, and we are going to actually figure out that Velvet was Ethereum. Yep, so that's where they figure it out. Is basically we also find out that Luffy Set has like a secret power to find where Earth pulses are, and They've been keeping all the Therians on Earth Pulse points. And if Luffy said is on an Earth Pulse point, he can kind of track it along to find out where other ones are. And that's why we're going to keep going back down to the cell at the very bottom of the prison. Because that's where the Earth Pulse point is. And if Luffy said is right there, he can figure out where the next one is. So we're again going back to the beginning of the dungeon. Great. Yeah. So we have to walk all the way down. Thankfully, on the way down, one of the sparkles that spawns can give us a rough gemstone issues we were talking about earlier. At this point in the run, it's not that relevant. We've already grabbed most chests that we can grab, but if we find it, it can save us like a few seconds later. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so there is quite a few more uh, uh, titles in this game. But yeah, combo art is just miles better than everything else you can ever imagine. Yeah, there's a lot of titles that are the same for every character, like get a certain amount of kills, they get a certain amount of MAs done and all that. And then the, each character has some unique titles that they can unlock. The one we unlocked there was like picking up a certain amount of sparkles and then Luffy said gets the title. All right. They're all irrelevant, but we're going to use a bottle just to save a little bit of walking. Yeah, but now that we found out that the Earth Pulse point that we're looking for is in the middle of the ocean. The fish Thankfully we're pirates, we have a ship, we can go there and look for it. It's time to go fishing! It's time to go fishing. <laughs> I'd love this <laughs> Norman head. Hey, don't be <sighs> Yeah, sure. Yeah. A bit listen, fine. But we <laughs> Yeah, so as we're here, um Velvet is kind of annoyed by everyone having fun. Velvet doesn't like fun. And Luffy said catches a big jar. And that jar starts spawning demons out of it. An octopod? It's an octopod. I guess it's a pod, not a jar. But... So for these demons, it's just kill them. They're all weak. <laughs> Might lose great. Might lose great. They were nothing. Yeah. So we figured out it was an octopod, but actually, it was a zombie pod. <laughs> but obviously, it's not always going to be just easy enemies. So actually what I'm doing here is I'm spamming Break Souls to get a little bit of BG back on Velvet since we didn't get an in-rest. And now this is the actual, the actual boss. So just like every other fight, we're going to dump a bunch of souls. And then try to do a combo here. Ooh, that's very good. Nope. So we need to go to 1 HP. This guy is very slow at killing us. If he does this ability, he's actually really fast. Oh. It's bad. You're wide open. This might not do enough damage, but we'll see. So the reason this didn't do enough, he actually lived with like what, 400 HP, is because he dropped out of the combo for a little bit, so as I was comboing him, he didn't have chain on him, I ended up doing a backup and procced chain at the very end of the combo, which just made us miss a little bit of damage throughout the combo rather than on the MA. And again, that shows how tightly damage is routed. Each fight is, if you miss a few hundred HP, you're gonna not kill. But thankfully, if they're low HP, you just have to 
do a break soul after and default. There is just MAs in order to kill. You can uh, you still do good enough damage with uh, break souls. Actually, the real problem with like doing no MAs is the soul burst that we talked about, how they break out of the combo. So if enemies didn't have soul burst, it wouldn't be that much faster to uh, do MAs. Like it would still be faster, but most fights like it's it probably breaks even to just uh, combo them down instead. On top of that, that would mean you wouldn't have to bother with BGs too much and just focus on switch break. Yeah. But yeah, the good thing about MAs is just it skips all the soul bursts. So now we found the next Earth Pulse point. Thankfully, the game didn't make us walk to the very bottom this time. We just kind of... It happens in a cutscene. And here, there's probably the biggest shop that we have to do in the game. So I'm just gonna... First, unequip everything that anyone still has equipped. I have to buy some bottles. And here, I'm gonna just... Oh, let me make sure that is actually... There we go. That could have been... Catastrophic if I did that wrong. Alright, so now we're gonna get Shell Shredder to plus five, Amber Belt to plus five, and Shockware to plus one. And now we're basically at our final equipment. So, right after that fight, we unlocked getting equipment to more than just plus three. We can get it to plus five, and we already had stacked enough fragments to be able to just do it immediately. That's why I was doing all the. So, earlier on, when I was Upgrading stuff to plus one and then dismantling it. It was all to prepare for this shop right here. All the bronze crap I was collecting was to pre prepare for this shop. So you guys don't need the Amphibly Blade anymore, right? No. So one of the old routes is instead of using Shell Shredder, we used to use an Amphibly Blade. And that one is also random drop. <laughs> From shop, yeah. Yeah, so it's very convenient that we don't need it. We used to look for two RNG blades, now it's only one. The problem is that one is really unskippable. Like there is no way around it. It's just such a big bonus in damage bonus as you get it, uh, as you could see on the toad. Like it's just unskippable. Yeah. yeah. So now we found out that the next Earth Pulse point is in near the the main city Logris that we we're in earlier. It's on top of this mountain. So we're just gonna go there to check if there's any Therians waiting up there or not. But. There is another surprise waiting for us. Right, there will be another surprise waiting. Uh, but I guess... Yeah, so... Now that all the weapons are upgraded... Another thing... Another reason why we upgraded all the weapons as much as we did... Like, specifically why I upgraded my rank by one... That doesn't give us any significant really stats. But every it's time you get a certain total amount of back. upgrades... So right now I was looking for 15 total. Like, I have 5 on my sword, 5 on my belt... 2 on the shirt... Two on the shoes, one on the ring, so 15 total. You get more total BG on that character. So the reason I did all those upgrades on some things that are not necessary is just so I could reach that threshold of total amount of upgrades. So Velvet has more BG, so we have less needs for sleeping and less needs for uh, you know, regening BG. Yeah. But we ran up to the very top of the mountain. There was nothing there. But now we're going to go to the village of Stoneberry. It's actually the only oversight we know of in this game, is they misspelled the town's name. It's actually Stonebury, but they wrote Berry at the top. And, uh, and the guy that's telling you where to go next. Like, that just shows how well made this game is. Like, there's no glitches or anything that we can use to. We get to use, this is the only thing we can, uh, we can call out. <laughs> it's the Stoneberry the typo. Yeah, the only thing we can use in this game is actually game mechanics, yeah. which are very much uh, like well thought and uh, planned. It's just that turns out we are using it a little bit too far for what was planned, not really. Because surely we are not supposed to defeat bosses in 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah. This time right here is a teleporter one, so he's going to show up in front of me in a second and just dodge around. They're a little annoying at first, but when you get to use to their timing, most enemies are very easy to dodge. This bee is similar to the beetles we were complaining about. But thankfully we walk out of its range. Because each enemy has like a certain range that they can move around, and if you walk out of that, they don't chase you past it. So this is why this area, even though it has some scary enemies, their range is small, so they never catch you. They are too slow at this point to catch us. Yeah. Yeah, at this point we have 
for a while we've gotten the max actual movement speed we get on Velvet, or not, you know, whichever character we're using in the overworld. Um, we're gonna get one more speed up, and it's actually right after this we get out of this village is our last movement speed increase. But it's not really movement speed. We'll see what it is in just a second. Let me use a better time. <laughs> All right. If I were a Bloodwing, where would I be? But yeah, we'll we basically earlier the... found out that there was a dragon in the area, and then they told us that the dragon goes to the mountain whenever it rains, and conveniently enough, it immediately starts storming. And now we're gonna go after that uh, dragon. Oh, and we got a blue thing on the mini map. What could this be? Yeah, so on the mini map, it's something in front of me called the Geo Tree. So now we unlock the Geo Board. The Geo Board is this. It's a hoverboard. Ooh. And we can only use it in areas where we get the Geo Tree for. So here they put it right in front of it, just, you know, as an introduction to what it is. But later on, most of the Geo Trees will be in the end of the dungeons, so we're not going to even get to use them that much, even though it's. This speed that I'm going right now is max speed in this game, which is still not much faster than just running. It still, like, feels much better. It feels better. The problem with it is the controls in it are very janky. Like, turning is very weird. So as you see, like, I'm kind of tapping my turns rather than holding it because the more you hold it, the faster you start turning. So you kind of just got to tap it. it. Controlling it is not the best, but you, when you get used to a pattern, it's not too bad either. You want Here we're going to switch, mainly just switch Velvet out of the party for the same reason we have been doing the whole time. So we can switch her back in, get more souls. And oh my god, it's a giant dragon. It's a dragon. Yeah, but training like this doesn't come around every day. So this dragon, we don't actually have to do its full health. We have to do about 9k. It Barely, no, it actually barely, exactly did enough. So, who is that dragon? So earlier we mentioned that Zavid had like a wife or something that turned into a dragon, and it was that dragon. And we tried to kill it because Aizen basically has it out to kill any dragon he sees because he thinks it's the only way to save the... Because it was a Moloch that turned into a dragon. He thinks it's the only way to save them, like killing them and saving them because they lost all control of themselves. But Zavid disagrees, because uh, it's his wife right there. So as we were trying to fight it, Zavid came up and stopped us. He's like, no, you're not going to kill her. But Aizen was like, I will eventually. <laughs> and it's actually one of the post-game bosses. If you ever do more of this game, it's it's another boss that you fight later, but not in the story. And it actually changes uh, Zavid's resolve. And uh, yep. it kind of, kind of uh, a nice uh, touch. To, to when you compare it to Zestiria. Yeah. It's like it's one of those quests that like doing it here, you learn why in Zestiria Zavid is the way he is. Like they kinda added this little side quest to to build on Zavid's character from the other game, which is very cool. So here the Geo Tree in the in the prison is right outside. So again it's very quick to get this time, but it won't be later. And once again we have to go all the way back. But now with a geoboard. And so now there is something funny with uh, geoboard and doors. Yep. Is that uh, actually if you hit the door uh, in the front of it, um, you will lose all momentum that uh, you've built uh, when you were using the geoboard. So what um, Lurking is doing right now is he's opening the doors from the sides on the corner. And that way, that is keeping the momentum uh, even after opening the door. Yeah. Whenever you use it, like as you can see, like, there's a bit of acceleration if you're stopped and then you're using it. But for some reason, if you're running into the corner, you're like still moving, so you keep the momentum when you go out. Funny deck. It barely saves any time, but we just do it because it's it's the only movement deck we have. <laughs> Like I, I was told, it's two frames per door. I feel like it's no it way. Feels, it's only two frames. It feels more, but it, that's what what I've heard. I never timed it, but it's very, very now, insignificant. Officer. You hear me? So now, unlike earlier, earlier the game took us back out. It won't do that this time. We have to actually hoverboard all the way and back. And back again. 
You got time for a donation while you're hoverboarding? Yes. We have $100 from Anonymous with no comment. And then $15 from Noob Tree. All right, here we go. Ellen, normally I just watch, but we are about to mega lose out on catching this Mystic Art Showcase. So I've Lafayette set my mind to Roku roll out a few bucks for it. As a Velveteran of the series, I Zen promise everyone it is something worth watching. So please, let's donate to a good cause and see a good show. I ran out of ideas. Bien! <laughs> I love that. There's so many like additional hidden ones like the, the turtles noises that were added in it. <laughs> All right. So now that we're out of the prison, we found out where the next Earth Pulse Point is. And it's back in the very first town we were in, the, the, the snow town, Elevies. So we're going to go revisit it. And on our way there, we're just going to be talking to a bunch of people to figure out where I mean, could the Earth Pulse Point be in this area. And basically, what everyone here says is that there was this, this little kid that turned into a demon. And then the kid's mom tried to defend him from the exorcist when they tried to kill the demon. And then the, the exorcist basically kidnapped the mom and took her over to a dungeon that's in the other area. So if we're kind of following the patterns that have been going on, every time the Abbey kidnaps someone, that ends up being where the Therian is because they're turning people into Therians. So now we're figuring out, like, okay, we know where the next Therian is. We know who it is. We just have to go capture it. If you go main, let the top have not why do who knows? And it's just time to to get to that prison. One interesting feature of the oh, hoverboard the is the that so if you're uh, hitting there. some lower Stop. level enemies, then they're just going to disappear instead of uh, adding, uh, the adding us, is to the north which is uh, pretty useful, only here. It's only useful here and one point later, but yeah, so you can just run over the enemies if they're significantly lower level than you. You don't get any rewards, you don't get anything out of it, you only get the satisfaction of running them over and not needing to turn a little bit to avoid them. So obviously, we don't have the hoverboard anymore because we haven't unlocked it in this dungeon. Look, no guards. This hoverboard feature is so frustrating. Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? I'd say good. We can march straight in. So now we figure out that this is where we have to be. Also, another like little fun fact if, uh, that connects it back to Zestiria. When we were in that town, we heard people talking about a person called the Lord of Calamity. We figure out that that's the, the title they gave Velvet. So if you played Zestiria, that's, that's the title of the bad guy in that game. And now we're the bad guy of the equivalent of Zestiria. So now Velvet has like a new title that she can flex over other people. For this dungeon, there's really nothing different than other dungeons. It's mainly just lighting candles to open doors, as we have been doing. The only thing that's different and makes this dungeon one of the roughest in the game, to me, is that you're going to have the hoverboard in just a little bit, and you're going to have to be hoverboarding through very small rooms that have a lot of enemies in them. And it's very, very easy to get encounters here. So there can be rooms with just three invisible enemies that you do not know where they are. And ideally you'd be hoverboarding so you're not slow. And it's just very easy to run into an invisible enemy before they even show up on your screen. So you really have to be careful and know about it. Yeah. Just to be completely safe, I will save because these fights can potentially kill you. And if you die to a boss, as I did like for example earlier against the Toad boss, you can just hit retry. But if you die to an encounter, you can't. You have to reload a save. So dying to an encounter is actually run killing, while dying to a boss is just time loss. And from here on out, like encounters, if you don't have a tutorial saved up, can't kill you. Because bosses are easy to just you know stagger the one boss, but when there is many enemies attacking you, it's not as simple. Yeah, we're. Really, just better in, uh, in this game to do one v one than do multiple enemies at the same time. Oh, I forgot the other. One. That's fine. I forgot a candle back there that the door didn't open. I just have to backtrack a little bit. Yeah, 
so this room here is like the worst. Uh, okay, there's no invisible enemies. There's three, so I know I'm safe. The annoying part is that they all stack up right in front of where you left the room. So whenever you try to enter it again, they're just all like walling you off. So sometimes you actually just cannot pass by a door without running into an enemy. So you just have to save and reload. But yeah, we just mentioned that we're not good against multiple enemies. We're only good against 1v1s. Well, this is a fight with six total enemies. It's just actually one of the worst fights in the run based on how much time it can save you or lose you. Also, interlink. And so, uh, Magnus' uh, break soul is pretty cool on this fight. So, Magnus' break soul allows her to interrupt the spells of enemies. And um, when she uh, she interrupts enough spells, she's going to cast a very high level spell. Uh, so, pretty fancy, pretty cool. So, I got stunned and poisoned there, so I lost all my souls. In this fight, since there are so many enemies, you can be attacking one and then another one like interrupts you. So, so it is actually one of those fights that there's just not much you can do about it. It's you just have to slowly kill the enemies and and they can always just mess with you. Thankfully, these ghosts are easy to kill. So if you need to get more souls, you can attack those, kill them easily. Meanwhile, these guys are resistant to martial arts. Or, I guess, not martial arts, but neutral uh, element. And that's what martial arts are. So you have to proc chain to build them decently. Which requires doing discord, which is slow. And sometimes they do that. They just sidestep out of the combo. Also, we unlocked Heaven's Claw, so if you remember at the very beginning of the game, I was talking about how some of the abilities Velvet was using in that one fight against a bunch of wolves were kind of abilities they unlock later. So we've been using Consuming Claw every time we break Soul and Velvet, but she actually has two others. She has Heaven's Claw and Hell's Claw. So now we unlocked Heaven's Claw, which whenever you do break Soul after doing only one art, she does Heaven's Claw instead, and it just does more damage than Consuming Claw. And later on, we're going to unlock Hell's Claw, which is pretty much the highest damaging ability Velvet has just to casually, normally use without having to worry about like MAs or anything like that, which will be massive damage later on. The interesting thing about uh, Heaven's Claw is that it picks up enemies from, enemies from the ground. Yep. So if they fall down, uh, usually like there is no good way to pick them back up, uh, so we can keep on dealing damage, and so Heaven's Claw allow you to pick them up pretty easily. Yes, right now we have Heaven's Claw and Water Snake Way, which both pick up enemies. Water Snake is not always great, so a lot of the times Heaven's Claw is just better to pick up enemies. It's because um, if the art that you're using is not effective against enemies, then it's not going to work out really great. Well, uh, Heaven's Claw is always uh, somewhat effective. So snakes! Yeah, this fight... So yeah, the boss is like a snake, and she summoned a bunch of snakes to fight us. They're very easy. We literally just spam gouging spin and break soul. Gouging spin again, the best um, physical art in the game. Just really fast, uh, can stun, decent damage. Pretty cool. So. As I mentioned earlier, the longer you're in Break Soul, the more damage you start taking. So I intentionally left Break Soul there because I don't want to be too low going into the actual boss fight. This fight is the same as everything else. The only thing is that there are more like golems enemies that we're going to have to kill. And I need to be close to Magilu because I have to use Spirit Beats with Magilu like I did for a couple other bosses. And the Adler golems can actually like body block it. But thankfully they were like not between Magilu and the boss. So it wasn't an issue. Oh, oh. I needed one more break soul. I tried to greet it thinking I had enough damage, but 
It doesn't matter, we just do a couple of Heaven Squaw and she dies. So fun thing about this fight is that these golems can actually be standing on top of Medissa, the boss, as you're hitting her. So sometimes you just kill them before you even do the MA. And sometimes you just have to clean them up. But yeah, that's what happened to one of them. Yeah, one of them died. Sometimes it's just all three of them stacked up. But yeah, now Medissa was the other Therian, so we just collected her too. She's tagging along with us. We have like four or five at this point. So as we have been doing, every time we get a new Therian, we go back. Titania, yay! Actually, we're not going back to uh, the bottom cell. Not all the way to the bottom. We're going back to where we found Ellen earlier. So it's like half the, the walk this time. We're basically going to talk to Grimoire, who is Mago's friend. We heard that she figured out more about the book. But actually, fun fact, um, Grimoire is not just uh, any kind of Malak. She's actually a Norman. Yep. You know, like the thing we've got on our head. And Bianfu. And Bianfu. Don't forget Bianfu. He's the greatest character in the game. And forgettable. Yeah, we just go up here. We, she, I think she basically tells us that she figured out everything about Inominat that she can with the parts of the book that we have that talk about Inominat. So we basically just need to find the rest of the book to be able to really figure out how to stop him. Again, that's a fake unrest because we don't pay. And now the next Therian that we're going to be looking for is actually in the continent where Velvet is originally from. So this is going to be the part of the run, you know, as in every game. <laughs> where you go back to the starter town. But if you remember earlier is at the very beginning of the game, how everyone in the village supposedly died. So now we're going back to what we think is an empty, you know, ghost town village. But on the way there here in the main city, we're going to hear that people that Velvet knew all along are still alive somehow. And Velvet basically goes into breakdown mode is like, wait, what is going on? Like, is everything that I know alive or not? Sure. It's just felt. Maybe, maybe I don't need to go for it. But uh, as we're running to the village, we have a little bit of time, so CC, you could take it over for a bit. All right, we're well, just letting you guys know that if you donate during this run, we'll just have to go up until. Which what do we got? The Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne run. You can win a Persona 25th Anniversary Bag, an SMT Nocturne prize pack that has pins, a poster, a hat, a mug, probably 80,000 other things in it. And if you donate $100 over the course of RPG Limit Break 2022, you are entered to win PlayStation 5 with Final Fantasy VII Remake and, oh, what's this? Tales of Arise? Mm hmm. The latest installment of the series. Very cool game. I really enjoyed it. Uh, very, very interesting cast and a very cool story. It plays out really differently from other Tales of games, but it's... It's really cool. It's a nice, uh, fresh take on the series that's been going on for 25 years at this point, right? Something like that. Around that, yeah. This is a bridge. I guess we didn't talk much about it, but every time we walk over a bridge in the whole run, there's been a cutscene. Yep. Like, I know earlier I mentioned that the game likes bridges and I forgot to elaborate, but the game loves putting cutscenes on bridges. So, yeah, um... If um, if the town of Velvet still exists, then that means Lafayette probably still lives too, right? Yep, that is basically what we're thinking now. Is like everything that happened the night where Velvet turned into a demon could all just be not real. Also, we picked up an Animalia ring that is the final ring that we're gonna have on Velvet. It is it does a lot of damage. It increases our damage to beasts as well, and there's some hard beast bosses that we fight later, so this one helps on them. But it also just gives more stats than the shock ward that we had previously. And coming up here will be potentially one of the hardest bosses in the run. It's called Xenomantis. So that boss has a very, very specific combo. 
to where like it kind of is magic how the combo works. We do as long of a combo as we can do. So where we do like the maximum amount of break souls, the maximum amount of arts. We go for it. The combo takes as long as Floric Blade buff lasts. So it's just everything is maxed out damage to barely kill the enemy. So we're getting to the point where what we have is almost not enough to kill bosses. Voice. Oh no, I'm not able to one-shot bosses. Whatever am I gonna do? Well, um, it's okay. This is fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, this is probably the hardest combo to execute nice. in the whole run. It is not similar to any other combo, it is very unique. We do so many arts and order of arts that we never do before. And after this boss fight, if you were quick enough to notice, you probably didn't notice. But Velvet is high, level, uh, Velvet, high enough ask. level in order to sure get her level 2 MA. Well, yep, so this was the last time we're going to see Lethal Pain. Well, hopefully, yeah, if I mess up again, we'll still see it again, but... Now we have level 2 MA on Velvet, which is... Just another Mystic Art that looks cooler and does significantly more damage. So, you know, I just said that we are reaching the point where we don't do enough damage to one-shot bosses. Well, that's not the case anymore. Actually, the next boss has probably the shortest combo out of any boss in the game. Because it's going to be the boss right after we unlock level 2 MAs and we're going to just demolish it. And, um... You really don't want to miss that with the uh, gnome in head. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be a sight to behold. But yeah, as we were fighting the boss, the reason we fought it is because it, the boss was attacking someone. We heard them scream before the fight. And that happens to be Velvet's best friend, who we saw a lot in the very beginning of the game. And she's alive. And remember that the whole reason Velvet is... As angry as she is, is because she thought everyone died, her brother was killed, but we just basically just found out that the village is not actually destroyed. Why would I want to take revenge if uh, there is nothing to take revenge on? Yep. So here we get back to the village, and we get greeted by everyone. It's the same village, Velvet. same people. Let's go to your house and The Velvet is like now wondering if Luffy said is alive, and what they told us is that he is. So this is where Velvet basically loses all motivation to continue what she's doing. And it's going to be just a quick callback to the very beginning of the game where we're going to go hunting again. And, uh, everything is going to stay fine like that. Yeah. Nothing right. wrong is going First to happen. Whip up my special quiche, and, then I'll and she went back to like her happy voice. Like the whole game she had like a different had voice tone than also. she did in the very beginning, which is a very nice touch of like... Going back to the other tone now, sounding happier. Shout out to the English voice hey, actors. Things, they did such a good I'm job in this game. Oh, yeah, 100%. Oh, yes. Like I already okay. mentioned it when uh, there's the Discord uh, shout, but like the whole thing is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so now that we found out that Luffy said, our little brother Luffy said, not the Malakim, Luffy said, it was still alive. We want to cook him food. And just like we did in the beginning of the game, we have to kill We're Prickle Boars. Keep but it is a little bit more interesting this time, and we will see why. So if you look at the the star at the top, it shows you where one set of prickle boars are. And earlier we had to kill three sets, and we have to do the same this time. We have to kill three sets of them, which are scattered across this forest. Much easier to kill too. But the cool thing is, there's an oversight in the game where if you save, reload the save, the prickle boars that I just killed respawn. So I just can do this three times of killing the same enemy rather than having to actually run throughout the entire forest. Again, I just save. Reload. And it's back again. Where is he? <laughs> there we go. And this actually counts as if we had killed all the prickle boars that we need. So we can just head back to the village now. Luffy's waiting for us. We should run on it seems so much movement because the places where you're actually supposed to kill them are so far away where you have to like go back to the very beginning of the dungeon. But... 
So here we have to buy a few things and buy one quartz piece. We're gonna dismantle that quartz piece. And since I just got a new ring, I need to get it to plus one again. Because as I mentioned, we need the 15 total upgrade. And the reason for that is to Does get more BG. BG. Yeah. So it's very important to actually get that upgrade there so we have enough BG for then not this coming boss, the, the boss right after. But yeah. Now everything's back to being bad. Velvet's angry again. The reason is, in that cutscene, um, one thing that in the lore is actually ever since Velvet became a demon, she couldn't taste food at all. But in that cutscene, she tasted food. And that made her realize that like something is not right. So she asked Mogulu if like there's any arts that make illusions. And she was like, yeah, this is what's going on. Mogulu knew, knew all along. She just didn't care to tell Velvet. She just wanted to watch the show. Yeah, my girl cannot just want to watch uh, the whole world, bro. She's uh, pretty chaotic. Yep. So this fight is actually very simple. Like, all the people that we thought were people were actually demons. And now Velvet is going to be even more angry because uh, she was deceived. Watch and I'll show you my... You... It was all a dream. Yeah. Hell, even if it wasn't, I won't turn back! Yeah, so my, uh, Velvet's angry again, and we figure out that they're... Well, actually, when we first came to the village, we went to go to the shrine, but everyone in the village was telling us that it, we're not allowed to go there, it's taboo. But now we don't care anymore, we're not listening to them because we know they were all demons that are just controlling us. And we're pirates. We're pirates. So here we're gonna find that Therian of this area. Oh, okay, hey, it's a good, the good old Cerberus. Oh, <laughs> he's running away. Come here, Dogo. Yeah, so this comp. Oh, he took my stun. Okay, we're gonna retry this fight. This is one of the bad parts of having to use AI. You can take your stun and then you can't do anything about it. You can't continue the combo because you can't break soul. But there's no good alternative. You kind of just have to hope they don't do this to you. And sometimes they do. That was nice. Oh, come on. There we go. So yeah, if you die to bosses, you can just retry, so it's not a big deal. Oh. Sorry. Oh, I could recover this. Mario, please. What am I missing? Oh. Nope, that's not enough damage. We didn't get the stun, so we do no damage. This time we got screwed up by Mogula basically not doing her thing. But he has low enough health that I can actually just clean him up. Like, we went past all the soul bursts. She took my stun again. Yeah. So if there's no soul bursts, we do this to every boss. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Also, shoutouts to the best music in the game. There's nobody here. This is reality. Also, another thing that happened during the cutscene where Velvet found out that everything is a lie, we found the actual version of the book that we're looking for. So that's why we're going back to pick it back up, but of course it's not going to be there. So we're now we're just going to basically be disappointed. We got the theory in, but we didn't really get what we wanted. But on the way out, conveniently enough, we're going to find a copy of that book. Because at the very beginning of the game, our brother Luffy said, um, wanted to buy Velvet a hair comb. But he didn't have enough money, so he copied Arthur's book, Artorius's book, and sold it to the shop. And since the town has been a ghost town since then, the copy that he sold to the guy is still just laying on the ground. So we picked it up, and now we actually have the book we've been looking for all along.
And again, in order to go back to the town, we need to hit cutscenes, and uh, then we'll be able to actually use our bubbles. Yeah, so there was a cutscene there, and there's another cutscene in this area. So, you know, we're like almost at the area we're teleporting to before we can actually start using bottles. Nope, that's the wrong area. Uh, 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 here. Then, let's see. And so I used a Denor bottle, an extra Denor bottle, and an extra Enoch bottle. Just to make sure I don't run out of money, I'm going to go grab an extra... Because I'm going to have to buy the extra bottles that I just messed up. So just to be sure, I'm going to go buy... Grab a Geld chest here. Because running out of Geld later, when we actually need to do our final weapon upgrades, can basically be run killing. So I just want to ensure nothing like that happens. Oh, it's the other way. All right. So here, we actually just fought multiple bosses without resting. And then... After this point, there's going to be a while where we can't sleep again, so this is basically a required in rest to have enough BG. And I'm going to stop by the shop just to buy a couple of extra bottles. Wow. Huh? Oh, that's the wrong guy. Wait, where's the shop? Yeah, just there. Oh, he's there. <laughs> oh, oh boy. But yeah, so another like small thing is that Cerberus boss that we fought was actually the Nexterian. They were actually the dogs of Velvet's friend that we saw at the very beginning of the game. We actually saw the dogs multiple times. Yeah. So not only did not the Abbey turn oh, no. little kids Fine. and normal people into Therians, they also turned innocent pets into Therians. How dare they do that to dogs? Trees the worst of evils. And this time the game's kind enough to not make you run all the way down. You just walk in and you walk out and you can go to the next area. No, you're fine. Fuck that. And Moana is, uh, yeah, now uh, becoming a, a little daughter to uh, yeah. that snake lady. Yes, it was like kind of convenient how Moana's lost her mom and then that other snake lady lost her daughter or her son. So they kind of just uh, replaced each other by <laughs> bonding back together. Me. But don't let your guard down for one yeah. second. So we have a relatively long dungeon to run through here, so you can uh, CC if you have anything to share. You can take it over for a, minute, a few minutes. More walking in Tales of Berseria? No way. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> we have $25 by Anonymous with no comment. Thank you so much, Anonymous. We have $10 from Anonymous for Best Boy Bien Fu. Bien! And with those donations, we are $1,100 away from the Mystic Arts Showcase. We are $1,100 away from 50K. We are so close. Two hours left. But I do want to remind everyone where these donations are going. We are here supporting NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization whose work is focused around three pillars, education and support, awareness, and advocacy. Via their 48 state offices and nearly 700 affiliates, NAMI offers a host of signature programs, presentations, and support groups that are available free of charge. This includes a national helpline that can provide information, resources, and a compassionate, understanding, trained volunteer to support anyone who calls in. Alright, so starting from this point on, we actually just unlocked another thing, not only Velvet's uh, level 2 MA, but we also unlocked Lafayette's level 2 Break Soul. And that's going to be used for a lot of the bosses from here on out. So what Lafayette's level 2 Break Soul does is it increases the stagger time on bosses. So if there's a boss that we can't burn or something and then they break out of combos quickly, we use Lafayette's level 2 Break Soul. But to do that, Lafayette needs to have four souls similar to what we've been doing with Velvet. So what we're doing from this point on with a lot of the combos is actually start with Lafayette specifically outside of the party. And the same way we've been switching Velvet in, we're going to have to switch Velvet in, switch Lafayette in, and dump a bunch of souls. So the very beginning of each fight just got even more complicated with how many inputs you have to do. 
And that's like one thing about this game where like when you see it being done, it's someone who's practiced it a lot. But the actual doing so many inputs at the start takes a ton of practice. Like it's not as simple as it looks. Yeah. And starting from here on out, the boss fights become... Well, starting from basically Xenomantis, the boss we did earlier, to the very end, a lot of the fights become significantly more complicated to execute than the earlier ones. Yeah, really like this game is really close to what you would see in a fighting game or something like that. If you've got a bunch of inputs to do correctly uh, at the correct timings and stuff. Well, the timing doesn't matter too much, but the difficulty of the input um, is uh, signific significant. Yeah. And yeah, so there is like very nice input buffering. So like as I'm doing an art, I basically just start mashing the next art and it goes off immediately after. You don't have to like time specifically when to use them, but... It's kind of just remembering which button to press next. Yeah. So when I changed my team formation there, I had to make sure that Luffy, like now it has to be a very specific team formation where like Luffy and El Velvet are both out of the party. And then the first two people in the party are Magilu and Bison. And then this dungeon has the same puzzle that we've been seeing earlier, which is, you know, switch doors where you open one you close another what were you two talking about nothing and a bit of lore on what's going on is we were going to get the last therian that we know of but on the way there we found an abbey ship that's signaling for help and even though we knew it's an enemy ship aizen insisted on helping them because apparently it's pirate code to help each other no matter what if someone is in distress and when we went there, we found out that it's Teresa on the ship, the same person that we were fighting earlier in the game. And she was warning us about how Oscar, the other guy that we beat up earlier, has gotten a new art from Artorias that is really strong but really risky. And since Oscar's her brother, she doesn't want him to use it because he might die if he uses it. So she's basically telling us that, like, to use her as a hostage to get him to not try to use that new art. And that art, again, is a big callback to Zestiria. It's a uh, an aromatization where that person mixes with the Moloch and they become one. But since it's uh, the better version, it's going to be quite different from uh, all the Zestiria version. Well, <laughs> quite different. It's going to look like uh, to look a lot like it. Okay, nice. <laughs> Can't go back there. And uh, actually, this is the point where we start seeing uh, enemies using uh, Mystic Art as well. And uh, this one is definitely... Well, we're not going to see it. I'm not sure if you're playing to showcase enemies uh, Mystic Art. No, uh, I was just only going to showcase yeah. the party. But the party has a lot of different Mystic Arts. Yeah. And a lot of different forms of Mystic Art that people might not be familiar with. So, again, if we get to that donation incentive, it will be a very interesting showcase. There's definitely enough Mystic Arts for your eyes to behold. Really, really lots of awesome ones. So now we got the Geo board in this area after running through the majority of it. Yeah, so there's one screen left. And in this next screen, we're actually going to grab one of the more important items in the run, which is an hourglass, which will be basically necessary on a boss later, or so we thought. So we're going to grab it now, and basically missing this item can be really bad, potentially. And then the other thing that's really important to not forget here is right before the next room with the boss, we actually have to do a little detour here. And if you remember earlier, I had to step on little teleporters to activate them so I can go through them when I revisit the area. But here there isn't a teleporter, but there is a wall that you can only break from this side. So if you don't come and kick it here, you're going to have to go through the whole dungeon again later. But since we remember it, we can take a shortcut and end up at the very end very quickly. So obviously you get it, you guessed it. Uh, so next boss fight is going to be Oscar. Surprise! Or that's what we, we think it's going to be. Right? Because Teresa said she's, she's going to be our friend and she's not going to attack us, right? So she, yeah. She would never do anything like that. No way. But surprisingly, yeah, we have to fight Teresa. She mixed with a with a demon, so she has like, some demon form here. She's actually the next Syrian. Do you realize what you're 
you're doing, Teresa? Yeah. <laughs> a trivial sacrifice. I'd do anything and for my Oscar. Yeah, so the church people are even ready to sacrifice themselves in order to uh, attain their goal. Which, uh, I did yeah. I messed up the tempo. Oh, I no. forgot to do a specific input. Oh no. So we're just gonna have to retry. No yeah, so missing. Oh, we get oh. to see Mystic Art. This is what we could potentially see a lot of if we need the donation. That, yeah. That's a Mystic Art from. Is this here again, right? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> or is it Xilia? I'm mixing it. I'm not sure. So this it's is a Mystic Art from an Ozark Tales game. I, I'm sure you guys will know about it. If you've got an idea of where this is from, don't hesitate to uh, to donate. Let us know. To... This is actually normal stuff for a bit of a run. Like, all the combos are very specific. That like almost no runner has ever finished a run with like perfect <laughs> um, combos, and it's really hard to. It's not the kind of combos that you look at right before the the run, right? Because like everything goes so fast, and there's so little variations that you can just mess up too. Yeah. So I think like even world record run still has one or two messed up fights. It's it's standard. <laughs> So it is. Now we are going to fight Oscar. Yeah, and he armatized. If you look at how he looks like, it should be a bit familiar from this area. The same for the abilities he's using here. It's all just this theory abilities. So here we're just going to bottom HP again using level 2 Lofty Set because that makes the stagger time longer on the boss. Or on the boss, yeah. So whenever we do the combo, it's not breaking out. Also, I'm going to have to change Quartz Boots and build it. There we go. Very spooky face from Velvet. Yeah, so here, um, we got rid of both Oscar and Teresa. Actually, Velvet ate both of them, she consumed them, and that's going to be actually relevant for later. It's like a fun thing in this game is like whenever you beat an enemy sometimes you just like have velvet have dreams with the enemies in them because they're still inside of her and she is talking to them. Maybe we have to do a little shop. So we got the, the quartz boots just now. That means we have to upgrade them. So we just need to buy three quartz pieces. Dismantle the three quartz pieces that we just bought. And then do the boots to plus two. And that is the last shop we're going to do for the rest of the run. So now all our equipment is at its final form. And as we're going back to our to our hideout, we get ambushed. Yeah, it turns out the, our hideout isn't exactly uh, too secret. Because, yeah. you know, it used to be a prison of the church, so... Yeah, so actually, like, throughout the whole run, we kind of realized that, like, it's like the Abbey where we went step ahead of us, they always knew where we were going next. So we always, like, were suspecting what's going on, and people always suspected Eleanor was like a spy because she's still an Abbey person. But in fact, it was Bienfu all along. Well, at least lately it's been Bienfu, not all along. Let's go. But uh, it's because Push Melchior put a spell on him and that spell variants. basically made him control Bienfu and made him basically tell the Abbey everything we're doing. But now that Magilo found out, she took that spell off and they don't know. They can't track us anymore, but at this point they already find our head out. So they filled it up with demons. They filled it up with exorcists. Yeah, I'm sorry. So this area is probably the most annoying in terms of encounters, because the the there's so many and a lot of them are invisible, and, and we're having to geo board. Makes me and sick. some of them stand right in front of the door, to where you literally cannot go through the door unless you reload the game or take the encounter. And to add to that, encounters here easily could kill us. So I still have some tutorials, so it's not too big of a deal yet. So it was you don't uh, it's okay. Thank you. I could Kurugo if you As you Roku, you have I am still you. And also, um, we just got a new weapon from Kurigane, which is supposedly the hardest sword in the world. And Roku is thinking that using this sword he can defeat Shigure. But we're gonna quickly find out that that's not the case. If you I know. Uh, 
So now we decided to use the prince we've been keeping here all along as a hostage to get ourselves to escape. And we also find out that Arturius himself is also on this island to try to stop us. So they basically Ooh. sent everything they had all to this island. Problems ahead. It's okay. This time we're strong enough to defeat Arturius, right? That's we've what got, we think. We've got level 2 MA. <laughs> surely, surely we're going to finish an hour and 20 minutes uh, ahead of this. Oh, that would be great if we can just actually fight him here. We're probably already strong enough to be able to fight the final boss. Funny. <laughs> that was two invisible enemies right next to each other, and because they were next to each other, it was a dangerous encounter. If I got that encounter, I would have probably been guaranteed dead. <laughs> this is fine. See, we have to do one more fight with these exorcists. Again, they just fall over. Oh, also, we did unlock um, he uh, Hell's Claw that I was mentioning earlier. Oh. Oh, he's out of EG. Um, Eleanor Brokero. Yeah, so Hell's Claw is... I'm going to do it here. Oh, I got... So one of the items that I have has a, an ability that gives you like a 1% chance or something to get crushed on an enemy. And crush just insta-kills an enemy and somehow landed there. <laughs> I I don't think I've ever seen it happen here. So that, that's the first for me as well. I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> yeah. It's a little like useful in all bosses where we have to farm um, dire foes which requires just fighting enemies in the overworld the over and over again. To escape. Crush like sometimes that. helps. And then the same Arthur's in the EX dungeon where you have to fight a lot of enemies. Right. Crush is useful but in this run it's never ever like used so. There is so little normal enemies that you have to fight so I keep the other matters. Yeah. Yeah, I actually didn't even know that we have it unlocked <laughs> at this point in the run. This Maybe it's a bonus one that you have on, uh, on your item. Right, so here we find that Artorius is here, but not only is Artorius here, Inominat is here. And Inominat all along was our dead little brother. Oh my god, it's life is at food I've thought. And Velvet's gonna have an even bigger breakdown now that she knows that the person she's been trying to kill is also the person she was trying to avenge. And this is the last fight that we actually cannot beat, so we just have to wait. Yeah, BG routing in this whole segment of the run is very tight. Like earlier I messed up and Aizen ran out, so I had to very carefully think about who to use as a backup instead, because if you use the wrong person, you might not be able to do the next fight uh, the same way as we would. So it would require some improvising. Oh my god. Alright, so welcome back to our spools, but this time with encounters. This time the encounters and very annoying encounters. So there's invisible enemies that teleport in front of you. There are snakes that are faster than you. <laughs> Almost got you this one. <laughs> and again, encounters here kill you. So that's why I've been quick saving every once in a while because... Pretty much every runner of this game who's actively ran has died to an encounter either in the prison or in this area. It's it's basically like a requirement that you have to pass through in order to, okay. to become a true runner or something. There's also this good old uh, hallway of death in uh, the second to last dungeon. Yeah. Shout out to, to Berlin, <laughs> who did the very, very first uh, marathon run of this game. And uh, yeah, he died, uh, he, he game over there it was interesting <laughs> to say it please so this dungeon is a lot of running and basically what's going on now that we're in the earth pulse Inominot basically has the whole earth as his like domain so he can do whatever he wants and what he's doing in the earth pulse is basically the earth pulse has a thing called the earth and historia that records events that happen in the world and he's just showing velvet all the truth of what's going on just to break her down even further and further because they want Velvet to fall to despair to be able to feed her to Inominat to become stronger. 
So they're basically just trying to make Velvet suffer by showing here like a lot of clips from the past and why Luffy said is a Nominat and why Arthur is doing what he's doing. Like they haven't been trying all along to, to make her suffer. Cool girl. But at least she has a nice mask. And a bad outfit. <laughs> <coughs> Actually, this area also has a lot of treasure chests that have usually very good items. It's one of those that you have to get them on the first time because you can't revisit this area, but again, in the run, we don't care about any of it. The only one we'll grab is one that's right by the final boss of the dungeon, not the final boss of the run. Thanks. We just hug a wall and they don't see us. If you look at the bottom right of the screen, you can see that like if uh, lurking presses Y, then there is going to be a, like a, a little skit that just yeah. shows the characters and what they're doing. A lot of them are very insightful to that story, and also a lot of them are very comedic. Yeah. It's one of those things that you have to do in order to really enjoy the entire story, because a lot of them are... But there is so there's, many. There's so many, but they're just great cutscenes. Yeah. It's all voice too, so yeah. Very good quality. It's, uh, it's called Skits, and there's been some since uh, Symphonia on the GameCube. Good old Symphonia. I feel like this game has them way more often than other games. Oh yeah, it surely does. It's like after every cutscene, there is like this one. Yeah, like there's another one now. <laughs> Without questioning a word. What a joke. What? Yeah, basically, we found out multiple things here is Luffy said didn't get killed. He asked to be sacrificed. He wanted Artorias to kill him because he knew from reading Artorias' book that we've been doing all along, looking for all along is two souls have to be sacrificed for Inominat to be restored and Inominat coming back can basically quell the demons. So he basically, because he had an illness and he knew he was going to die soon, he asked to be killed or sacrificed rather than him getting actually murdered. We also found out that Velvet's sister, how she died and how she became serious and how the Malak Luffy said is actually Velvet's nephew reincarnated. So all along they were actually family. She wasn't just trying to make him her family, she, he actually was. Yeah, this whole game is just a uh, family business. Yeah, basically. Gone wrong. Just that. I mean, the same with Rokuro. He's just the whole time, the whole reason he's here is to kill his brother. Same for Aizen, actually, as well. You. He's just trying to make a better world for his sister. Sister. And, uh. Shout best girl. Shout out to the best character in Zestiria. So this is the next boss. This is actually Velvet's true form or something like that. What is this thing? An amalgamation of multiple demons? And so the problem of this boss, oh, at least ca uh, especially dead. casually, is that it reduces all your damage by 80, I think. And that's quite a lot of damage reduction because most of your damage is coming from combos. And so if you remove the ability to deal damage from one art, then uh, that's a big shame. And but in order to bypass that, you have to hit all the weaknesses to get the ball hit. And uh, you can also just uh, just be a speedrunner and just get the chain and get the mystic guard and lol he's dead. So this didn't work out because Rokuro, I made him use an art and he missed that art. But I did enough damage that I can just clean him up. I just need to proc chain on him again. It actually might be better to retry this fight. Yeah, as you can see, Gaojin Spiggins is doing zero damage. Which is a shame. Because, uh... Yeah. We'll try one more time to combo him. If it doesn't work, we'll retry it. Oh, that's fine.
I will say one thing about this fight is that it has a better combo. I just refuse to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> I like the combo that I do, so I just stick to it. Oh, might be time to reconsider. <laughs> yeah, he's dead. There you go. Yeah. There's actually another boss fight right after this one. A minute and eight seconds. How long was that boss? Fools, all of you. All right, so that's Melchior. Uh, it's like the second in power uh, in the Abbey after after use. This guy just falls over. So Velvet one combos him. It's gonna do like crazy damage. He just dies, and then here, we can actually kill this guy. Oh, I can kill him quickly. So we usually use him to farm BG for the next boss, but since I messed up the previous fight, I already have enough BG. So we so just use, like, a three health claws, and he dies. So this is uh, number two, you know, uh, back from the Terza fight in, uh, in the first dungeon. Also, uh, yeah, this is a little... We'll go back to the stereo again. Absolutely not the EX dungeon of the stereo. The size of the art that created this place. Just what is the These are five life bottles. They're completely optional, but we just grab them for safety. Yeah, remember the five life bottles that we picked up in the early game? Well, we haven't used any. <laughs> yeah, I picked up like what one or two backups, and I haven't used any of them. But I don't think you need any at this point. I think you've got ten right now. Like you're fine. Yeah. So wait, there is no more shop now, so you don't even have to pick up the rough gemstones. No. For the quarantine here. So this, yeah, That's this area has two guaranteed rough gemstones, but in this run we don't need them, so we just run over them, run through them. In all bosses, which is a run that does obviously a lot more, we they're basically mandatory. Yeah, you need a lot more damage output in uh, all bosses in order to, well, do all the things yeah. somewhat fast. So the formation in here is actually very important because the next boss is going to be two phases and after the first phase, Luffy Set leaves the party. So we need Luffy Set to be in the first slot in the party formation so when he goes away, it shifts everyone like one slot earlier. So it's very important to have Velvet in the sixth slot rather than, you know, outside of the party. Because if we have her in the fifth one, in the second no, phase, she's going to start in the party. It that means we can't dangerous. do the combo by switching her out and back in. Twisted morality. Yeah, so the next boss fight is, um, yeah, probably the boss fight that everyone hates in the community. Yeah, it is by far the, the worst fight in the entire run. So hopefully this is going to go well and uh, not absolutely painful. We just have to run out of this dungeon and then... Basically, we don't even know how we ended up here. We left the Earth Pulse and we ended up in this area. And conveniently enough, Mogula was there. The only reason we were able to escape is that Mogula found the Earth Pulse Rift and she protected it so we can leave. So even though she acts like she doesn't like us, she actually saved us here. Yeah, and turns out <coughs> Mogula is uh, quite more powerful than you would expect. Because yeah. she was actually a student of Mad Girl. Is uh, you know this uh, big bad boy magician that we just saw. I came here by ship. It's anchored by the southeast beach. Also, Zavid came to rescue us somehow. It's cool stuff. All right, this is pretty much the hardest fight in the run. So the thing is, uh, this boss fight ends. Uh, so if you take out uh, a fourth of his HP, I think. Um, then the boss fight is going to end after a little bit of time, but you can also just kill it and it's going to end the fight faster. But the thing is, the, the big problem with this boss is that it's going to heal a lot of HP uh, at some point and that's unstoppable. Uh, so you cannot drop this combo. Because if you drop this combo, then the boss fight is goes absolutely terrible. I already did it wrong, but I'll try oh, to recover no. it. He dropped? He dropped out of the combo, okay. And so the Hourglass is probably the most powerful item in any Tales games. 
because it allows to stop time for an enemy for a pretty long amount of time. Did you just cancel the soldiers? Somehow, yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. I've never seen that. What? This should do enough damage to kill him. Yeah. Okay, so if not, the boss is actually just gonna, like, the fight will just end in a little bit. You can see the Mutant Gem is uh, healing that much HP. Yeah, he stunned all of us, it doesn't matter. So since we got him below quarter, we can just wait it out. Wait, I forgot uh, to do like a whole part of the combo initially, which is why he dropped out. This fight is very specific. But... Alright, so phase 2 is also going to end before he hits uh, 0 HP. And this time, uh, it, you, we won't have to wait for it. Me too. You stay out of this. Get down the point. Always. Like... You'll just have to flip it over for me. Not happening. And I. So again, dropping down to one HP in order to proc Ferroid Blade bonus, which is thirty percent some more physical damage. Oh, what do you got? And also Phalanx Rays, which uh, drop, uh, which is. Uh, Dragon weakness. So he decided to drop out of the combo, but I'll just combo him again. Yeah, this guy really likes dropping out of combos for whatever reason. Yep, which is what's really annoying about it. On top of, you know, the Omega heal. I think at this point, I'm better off retrying the fight. The real unfortunate part about this boss is how long it takes for him to kill you. So now I'm just gonna have to wait for him to kill me. I could ult a 4 and retry, but that means I have to do the first phase again. So I'm better off just waiting until I die and then trying again. And I'm not even sure if you quick save right before. I'm not sure either, and that's why I definitely won't <laughs> do it. <laughs> I usually always do even in like PB attempts, but oh, don't do that. Okay. okay, so Aizen is able to cast Resurrection right now. That's not a really good idea when you're trying to die. Yeah. And he keeps using the weakest ability he has. At least it's AoE. It is AoE and they're all stacked. That's the best attack he can do. Oh, he's gonna hit all of us. Oh, Rokuro, why did you go away? <laughs> I think he used a break. Look out trying to point to Everything's changed. We're still in the same bind. Everything's changed. It's trying to become someone new. It's a gamble. I'm in. Me too. You stay out of this. The dumb coin always lands on skull. Then you'll just have to flip it over for me. Right, not happening. I'm going to the jackpot here. Oh. So we're gonna try to combo him again. Just need to get a stun here and he should die. Nope, he broke out before that happened. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, we're gonna retry again. This is just how this fight works. So if you remember earlier on, Person donated saying he's excited to see me get bodied by Hellkite. This is Hellkite. <laughs> Shout out to Hooligan. Wait, the reason uh, this combo dropped in this specific fight is that I was supposed to do Shadow Flow into a dash. Dash counts basically as a combo step, but it's faster than doing spin. I accidentally did Shadow Flow into a spin, so you know, one wrong input and the whole fight goes away. This time. All right, you got this. And neither will we. Nothing's changed. We're still in the same bind. Everything's changed. He is trying to become someone. It's a gamble. So we also get to use a soul bubble here. 
So Soul Bellows uh, gives you back uh, three more souls, which is pretty neat because that allows you to do more break souls. Okay, it should be good enough. So again, we don't actually have to kill him, we have to get him low enough. This wasn't quite enough, but it's generally normal for phase two, we just do this and he dies. Oh, he healed himself. Okay, that's fine. He's almost dead. And actually, if I don't kill him, the fight will auto end in a second, so we got him. Nice try. This is like a super hard to auto, auto step to to step away because it's really hard to tell when you're gonna get hit by the knight. There we go. We had, the All worst right. part about this fight is not only that it is the hardest fight in the run, you have to do it twice back to back, and both of them are just as punishing to mess up. Carry the poor kid. Damn, but now that he's done, basically, the opposite. we're like in the victory lap of the run. There's really nothing tricky to do anymore except for the final boss, and even that is not that bad. Like, we definitely got past all the difficult fights. So here we have to do a forced in rest, but this one, since we actually have to pay for it to progress the story, we do get our BG back, which is basically required, because we haven't gotten to do an in rest for the past, like, five, six boss fights, maybe more. Yeah, something like that. Curse it all. If only I'd notice sooner. So here, um, actually, all the pirates uh, with the ship actually took the ship and left without us because they heard rumors of where their missing captain might be and they didn't want to wait for us. So we have to steal yet another ship, as we do, and go basically meet up with them to find out uh, what's going on. Yeah, we're back to that dungeon where we fought uh, Teresa and uh, Oscar. Yeah. If you remember earlier, I said that I have to kick down a wall so I can re-enter it. Uh, re, you know, they use it as a shortcut, and that's why because we have to go back here to fight the next boss, which will be Ifrid. So Ifrid uh, is the captain of the boat. Obviously, something went pretty wrong for him for him to disappear like that. Yeah, he's been missing for the entire game. That's the whole reason Eisen's been with us because he thinks the Abbey has to do with him being missing, and he's right. Anyway, yep. this is where the shortcut is if we run through here. We get to jump to the last screen of the dungeon. And you cannot jump with the geoboard, so. Nope. And the geoboard takes a bit to accelerate, so if you're going over small distances, it's actually slower than running. So for like a platform like this, you're better off, but this one is like a, bit of, a little bit longer, so you can geoboard, but. Formation changes here. We need coffee set in first slot and him out. Oh. So the next boss fight is actually like one of the easiest in the run. So even like there isn't, we basically can't kill him with an MA because we can't chain him. He has a, a status element that's called unknown or a weakness called unknown, and you just cannot proc that. So you can't do chain on him, which means you can't, you know, get multiplicative damage. And the interesting thing about uh, Velvet's um, Zerion mode attacks is that it's going to change depending on the enemy type. So human discord, uh, as we explained for, uh, earlier, and that's obviously proc chain. But on a boss fight, on a boss with um, enemy type unknown. It's going to proc your random um, soul, uh, break soul art, and therefore not going to do much. What's not doing? Else claw. But yeah, this guy, like, even if you don't kill him, it's so easy to just keep him in a combo and just kill him, so. Oh, there we go. And he's dead. I think it's probably not even much faster to do an ME on him. The only we do, reason we do it is to skip one uh, 
Soul burst. One soul burst. So yeah, we, there we found out that Ifrid was basically turned into a demon by the Abbey. We don't, huh? the first, right? But he wasn't like, they couldn't completely control him. He was strong enough to where he can kind of keep his own will. And that's why he, over there in that cutscene, he turns back to a normal person almost before we have to kill him because he would just kind of die regardless. And so now we realize that like... Arturus is actually managing to do what uh, what he was aiming for, which is uh, remove the free will of everyone on the planet. Yep. So his thought process was people are evil. If you let people do what they want to do, they're going to be evil. So he's going to take away people's will and basically turn them into puppets. Inominat's power did all and, but that way there is no more evil God in the world, right? Gods. Yeah. So yeah. that works out. So no more evil means no more... Malevolence from people means no more demons. That is the solution, is to just turn the world into basically nothing. A little bit too extreme. And uh, as always, being too extreme is uh, never a good idea. And um, yeah, so those angels are uh, pretty annoying. And in order to prog their weaknesses, we have to use uh, Infernal Torrent and Solar Dance, which are not very great arts, but it works out. They were nothing. So Infernal Torrent is actually like, it does a lot of damage, but it takes so much soul gauge that if you use it, you just basically run out of soul gauge and you can't use, uh, you can't do much longer of a combo. Which is the main reason why Gojang's ping is so good is because it's got nearly no soul, uh, soul gauge. So you can spam it really hard. And yeah. obviously, as you can see up to throughout this run, the more combos you do, and the longer your combo is, the better. So being able to spam is all good. And like one thing that we didn't touch on much is that the longer the combo gets, the more, the quicker enemies can start breaking out of it. It's a way to make you not do very long combos. But if you're doing very fast arts, like gouging spin or harsh rebuttal, like it's still fast enough to where, even with the faster recovery time, they can't break out of the combo. Yeah, like there was a lot of built-in strategies to prevent infinite combos. Uh, because if you know a little bit of, uh, about the advanced strats or the speedruns of uh, Tales of Games, you know that like pretty much all Tales of Games are trying their best to do infinite combos. And there is really just... I think just Graces manages to, uh, to not have infinite combos. And well, Arise, but Arise plays very differently. So, yeah, the, there's been attempts every, uh, in every game uh, with uh, a never-changing battle system. And uh, well, they somewhat manage to a certain degree, but speedrunners have uh, way too much time on their plate <laughs> in order to figure out the weaknesses of, their pl uh, of the devs plan. So earlier we had to fight one of the angels. Now we have to fight three of them. Same plan. Same strategy. That's bad. Oh my god. Oh, that gave me a damage debuff. That's not good. Rude. Yeah, so this fight, like, you can't die. It just ends up being a little bit slower. It's not a problem. But again, like, Hell Squad does so much damage that even with some damage debuff, it's just not gonna change anything. Yeah, side base. Oh, that was a very lucky burn. I was gonna run out of Soul Gauge there, so I would. It's not gonna be able to continue the combo, but again, every time you stun or you burn or you do any kind of status effect, uh, this is going to give you one um, uh, one extra soul, vo uh, soul, vo soul gauge. Soul. Actually, there um, when I did uh, Jet Blizzard, it poisoned the angel, and that also gave me back a soul. Yeah, so now we just need to figure out a way to stop this whole, you know, mind control thing that they're doing. And the way that we're going to do that is by... Oh, I actually teleported to the wrong place. It doesn't matter. 
Um, so there are more gods than just Inomina. There's the four elemental Empyreans, as they're called, but they're all like deep asleep. And we need to go wake them up. And then they can basically fight back against uh, Inomina to stop whatever he's doing here. So in order to do that, we're oh. going to go to set sail into the big giant volcano. Oh. That is uh, in the elevase and uh, nearby. Yeah. So actually back there, um, we were supposed to get to the ship and I teleported to Port Zexen to get back to the ship, but we recently found out that teleporting to Port Cadnix is slightly less movement to where it saves like maybe a second or two of less movement, but it's just a new discovery that I always forget about it. <laughs> so here we're back in this dungeon that we were in way earlier where we fought the snake lady. Thankfully we don't have to go through the whole dungeon, it's just... The dungeon has two exits, one that was blocked off earlier, but now it's opened up and when we go through there it's gonna take us to the next area. Here we're grabbing a quick bottle that we're using pretty much in the final boss. So yeah, arcane bottles uh, allow you to get plus two, two BG on a given character, which is very good. Yeah, as we run through here, um, we have maybe a couple minutes. Uh, if you have any announcements, Cece. I've got some donations here. We've got $5 from Toast Sandwich. You've done it lurking. You have become the Tales of Brasaria 2017. We've got $10 from Jetboy the Mage with no comment. Thank you very much. We've got $50 from Captain Falcon coming in from Super Smash Brothers. Hey, Velvet, show me your moves. <laughs> and we've got $15 from Old Man Jables. If Bienfu has one million haters, then I'm one of them. <laughs> if Bienfu has one hater, then I'm that one. If Bienfu has no haters, that means I'm dead. And we have less than an hour left in this run, it looks like, and about $1,000 for the Mystic Arts Showcase. We are less than $1,000 away from 50K. Just a reminder, if you donate during this run, $5 gets you into winning that Persona 25th Anniversary bag, which I really want, honestly. $15 gets you in to win that SMT Nocturne prize pack. That prize pack had pins, posters, a hat, a mug, other things. Um, and if you donate all, uh, $100 during the course of RPG Limit Break 2022, you get entered to win our grand prize, a PlayStation 5 with Final Fantasy VII Remake and Tales of Arise. Thank you. So um, here we had to get into a village and there was a little demon in there. We killed it and as we killed the demon, basically everyone realized that we are the, the big evil people everyone's scared of. And we basically take over this village at this point. It becomes our new hideout in a way. But we're basically ready to go to finish off the game, beat the last like three bosses. But before that, you know, there's the classic JRPG, like talking to everyone, seeing how everyone's feeling before the final battle. So we just have to run around this town, see what everyone's doing. Rokuro is getting new blades. Eleanor is going to be playing around because that's all she does. Hi. And then after this, um, we're going to have to the second to final dungeon. It's going to be the big volcano. First, we still only have to talk to Aizen, who was... I think reading a letter from his sister, I think, is what he his final uh, preparations are. Yep. Good old enough. Yep. So yes, there is really not that much left in the game uh, before we have to get the incentive met. And we have a thousand dollars to, uh, to get, so uh, yeah, you can do it, guys. I'm sure... Uh, I'm sure you've got it. You've got what it takes. I'm sure we could do it too. We have enough time to 
Just don't die, okay? I'll try my best. Yep, so here is another area where we don't have our G-board again, and this next dungeon is actually really annoying. The G-board is in the very last screen of the dungeon, so the whole thing is going to be just running. Really stupid dungeon. Yeah, this is... Like, I can feel a every dungeon we have complained about being uninteresting, it this one is the peak of that. It actually doesn't even have... Like, other ones had, like, torches that you had to light up or little doors you had to open. This one doesn't have anything. Just have to run. And run will do. Yeah, so those centipede enemies that I just ran past are actually faster than me, so I have to be very careful of them not seeing me. And if they do, I have to, I have to be next to a wall. Let's drop a quick save just in case. But yeah, so the reason we're here is again, since Inominat basically took out the will of all people, we have to wake up the Empyreans. But in order to wake them up, oh, I need to make sure I don't get caught here. You are definitely getting caught here. So that's the strat, if an enemy is going to catch you, you could just reload. <laughs> but yeah, in order to wake them up, we have to basically offer up powerful souls to them, so they can basically think they're worthy to wake up. There's four Empyreans, we need to give them four souls. So far we have um, Oscar and Teresa in, in Velvet's stomach. So we need two more, so conveniently enough, along the way we're going to fight two bosses, which are the last two remaining people of the Abbey other than Artorias. Which will be Shigure, who we fought way earlier, and then Melchior, who we fought a little bit ago. And low wise, uh, Velvet is a little bit less angry now because she's decided she's not going to fall into despair, and instead, uh, it just uh, just has a resolve to end uh, Artorius' uh, resolve and uh, change it with hers. Which is just to, to make the world free. Yeah. So earlier, after we fought the, the Chimera boss, Velvet basically almost sacrificed herself. She was like, yeah, I don't care about living anymore because she found out that Inomina is her brother. But Malak Luffy said yelled at her, told her that she's just whining and she should get over it. And she does. A strong character. <laughs> right here. Wait, the what? Uh, Velvet. Is a strong character. Yes. It's a, it's a really nice change compared to the usual uh, main characters that you can have in Tales of Games or even general uh, yeah. RPGs. Like, she just doesn't. She just doesn't want to be nice. <laughs> she she just wants to get her goal done. Yeah. Which is a, an interesting part of this game to me is how like basically all the characters they don't even try to be good. Like. They don't even try to hide it. They just like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna kill I'm people to get what I want. I'm a bad is, guy. You know, you don't see often in games, which is it makes this game unique enough. Yep. yep. So at the end of this room earlier, um, we mentioned the hallway of death. It's gonna be this next area. Walls are too far away. Yeah, so the reason it's called the Hallway of Death How is, as you're going to see in a second, it's going to be not really the a lot death. of enemies be out in, the open, in a very tight us. hallway. They can easily like, catch us. Thankfully, we're getting good enemies. There's another type of enemies that's a lot faster. But generally, if you hug the wall, you will be safe. But it can always be a little scary. Yep. If I... They're just... I'm gonna be going back to doing the same thing I was doing against like Oscar earlier, which is using Lapis at level 2, um, Mystic, uh, Brixel. So I had to switch him and Velvet out of the party. And then, you know, it's a long screen for no reason just to find Chigurit sitting there. Yeah, I mean, you like working, right? <laughs> <laughs> Have some fun. You got it. 
This combo, we used a bunch of Searing Edges on him initially to increase our combo multiplier. He actually got burned, so that makes it even easier. Since he got burnt, I don't know if Luffy said it's necessary, but we use it just to dump souls anyways, and then just do a small combo and he dies. So now, Rokuro basically got his goal done. He killed um, his brother that he's been trying all along. If you want to leave now, Rokuro, I won't stop you. Don't forget, my purpose here is to repay my debt to you. And that debt that he's talking about is at the very beginning of the game. He lost his sword, and we're like, "Oh, I saw a sword downstairs. Is it yours?" And he, that enough for him was like, "Okay, I owe you my life because you told me where my sword is, and that's why he's still sticking around." Rokuro is pretty stupid. <laughs> so now we're in the inner part of the dungeon. Now it's fiery instead of icy. Like a true volcano. Yep. Teleporting enemy is gonna pop in front of me. This guy's also faster than me, but there's a wall. Walls are great again. If you are hugging a wall, um, then it's going to de aggro enemies for whatever reason. <laughs> Wait, I noticed that we still don't have the Geo board. I've ran through the majority of the dungeon at this point and we still don't have it. It's just probably the worst uh, speed up mechanic they could have came up with. But yeah, um, on our way up here, we found out that Melchior is also in this dungeon. So he's going to be the next boss, and that's going to be basically Makilu's subplot getting closed out after we beat him. We did Aizen's, we just did. Rokuro's and then there's gonna be Mogulus. Eleanor is not important enough to get one. <laughs> but yeah, as we're running through, uh, we have a couple minutes uh, if you want to take it over, CC. Uh, yeah, I have a question for you lurking. Do you wear t-shirts? Uh, sometimes, yes, I do. Oh, that's convenient because the Yeti is sponsoring RPG Limit Break 2022. You can head over to the Yeti. That's Y E T E E dot com slash R P G L B and pick up some t shirts. Five dollars for each t shirt sold is going right to Nami. The old buzzard is nothing like Shigure. He won't fight us head on. So now, as we're running up earlier on. So, the Geo board, it's here. Yeah. So Rokuro, when we were fighting Shigure, he told us that Shigure is too stubborn to put any traps. He's just going to be waiting for us. And now Mogilu is like, no, I know Melchior. He's going to be trying to set up a trap, so be careful. You know, just two opposite characters that we have to fight back to back. And obviously, we're going to run straight ahead. Yep. Because we are not really that smart. <laughs> but yeah, the Geo board is almost there, but... You know, as you can see in the next screen, there's that dungeon icon. That's because it's the last screen right after it. <laughs> so it, it's not even worth it to pick it up, right? No, it's still worth it because the next screen is also like a little long. So. Oh, it's uh, it's still props on the next screen. Yeah. There's only one G board earlier on. Um, that procs in only one screen. So it's the screen right before we, right before the dungeon where we fought Oscar. Yeah, There's right. a G board at the end of the screen for just one screen. So, <laughs> that one is almost useless to pick up. But this one, like this screen, is big yeah. enough to where it's, it's worth picking it up. Right, this is Melchior. Combo will be also similar. The only difference is now Velvet is a little low on BG, so we can't switch her twice as we have been. We're only going to switch to her. And then we have to farm a little bit of um, BG on him. And also, this guy has very weird stun, so we actually stun him to reset his stun to zero. So when we start the combo, like we know exactly when he's going to get stunned, rather than it being very variant.
And you should stun here. Yep. And that is Melchior. So with that, we only have the final boss, which is a you know back-to-back -back bosses left, and that is all that's going to be in the run. So it's very close to the end. But yeah, what happened there is a little bit of him being tricky. So he almost actually killed us, but right before he did, Magula put an illusion flower under him, and apparently he likes flowers so much that he basically died just to not step on the flower. <laughs> and that's the only way we actually managed to to beat him and what's it called? Um, awake the Empyreans. So now people's wills have came back, and also Malakim are not controlled by exorcists anymore because they also got their strength back. So at this point, the Abbey's almost in shambles. The only thing they have left is Artorias himself. And obviously, that's going to be where we go next. Yep. And Artorias is uh, going on his uh, in his fortress yep. in Logaris. So we are going back there. We have to run through here. Unfortunately, in this area, even the geoboard, like the geotree seems like it's on the map close by. You actually have to climb like two ladders and run around the buildings to pick it up. That even though we pass by this town twice, it's still slower to go and get it, so we just have to actually run. Now we just have to go towards Zexen, which is... We're basically going to go back to where we initially fought him and got beat up the very first time. And then just run through the final dungeon, which will be about probably 20 or so minutes left in the run. So again, for the Mystic Art Showcase, we have probably about 20 minutes left to reach that goal. So here, in this next screen, this is actually another area where we have a G-board for only one screen. It is a big enough screen, or actually it's two, but it is big enough to where it's worth picking it up. Wait, look! Wait, look! Actually, even if you look, you don't see it. <laughs> Good stuff. Sadly, I can't control the camera when I'm the view board, but yeah. So you look at this guy. There's actually wait, maybe you do see it. Do you? Kind of see something on the very top middle of the screen. Ah, right? yeah, right. Yeah. Wait, you can't actually control the camera angle when you're in the view board. As soon as you hit, hit it, you're stuck in the camera angle, which is one of the reasons it's actually really annoying to control it. Wait, well, yeah, there's a teleporter that takes us to the final dungeon, which is just. It's Sky Fortress, and the dungeon is just called Inominat, and very bad start. And beetles are scary. So this beetle has the same movement as the beetle at the beginning of the game that we were talking about being very annoying. And this beetle can kill us. I'm actually gonna... So the reason I switched to Rokuro there is because... I was talking about tutorials earlier, how if you get into an encounter, a tutorial can save you. Magulus tutorials only pop if the enemy has a spell cast because it's a tutorial for her break soul and you can only use her break soul against spellcasters. And not all enemies are spellcasters, but Rokuro's works against every enemy. So even though it's a bit slower, I'm gonna open up I opened up the screen and switched Rokuro to first slot because you only get the tutorial for whichever character is in slot one. And if I get caught I'll end up switching to Aizen and so on, just to maximize the amount of tutorials I get. Because enemies here will almost definitely kill you if you get an encounter. Thank you. Yep. And so I hope you guys enjoyed this banger of the theme because uh, we're here for a while. Yep, so this dungeon is huge and there's not much to do to make it shorter. There's so many beetles. <laughs> this is fine. This is all fine. I don't like it. Yeah, it's actually like a small like a thing that is easily overlooked when doing the strength to figure out where to find time saves. It's easy to think that movement is consistent and you always because it's simple enough you're just running from point A to point B. But a lot of the time variance actually happens from what enemies spawn and how much running around you have to do like I did there. Like if all the enemies is this little lamp that doesn't move, you can just cut straight through the middle. But if you get a lot of beetles or a lot of uh, this guy that kind of surround you, you have to start maneuvering around, and it does add up a good amount to the movement. So 
so the premise of this dungeon so far is there's just a bunch of teleporters and we're trying to get to the very top of this uh, this fortress and we just have to find teleporters that take us higher and higher and then some teleporters are deactivated so you have to go to find where to activate them so this first one was here and then we're gonna the next teleporter basically opens up the next area so it's just basically running from different teleporters over and over until you get to the top. Lurking, do you have time for a donation? Yes, we have a lot of time, actually. Well, you may have noticed that we passed $50,000 for NAMI. Ooh. And it's because of a $1,000 50 donation by someone named Cece. Oh, oh my God. My God. <laughs> I would just like to thank everyone so much for allowing me to be a part of something so special. These past couple of years have been some of the hardest in my life, but seeing all of you come together really shows me that there is a light out there for everyone. I'm happy to be able to support others. Thank you to Nami. Thank you to RPG Limit Break for allowing me to be a part of this. Thanks to everyone watching. I've had an incredible time this week, and I'm sending lots of love to everyone. And that means the Mystic Art Showcase has been met. Woo! Let's go, CC. Thank you so much for the donation and meeting the incentive, and that is a lot. It's an amazing donation. Thank you. You're doing great up there. So after this run, whenever we beat the boss, we will go back, reload a save, and start doing a bunch of Mystic Arts. <laughs> we'll be able to showcase some cool stuff that this game has to offer. That A lot of them that are never explained, so a lot of you might not even be familiar that that is possible to do. So this dungeon is separated into two different areas, like the other like outdoor area and then this area that's more, I don't know, indoorsy. <laughs> this one has easier enemies, it doesn't have beetles, so it's more chill to run through. It does have invisible enemies and teleporting enemies, so you're not completely in the clear, but you kind of still have to just run around it, it doesn't make much of a difference, but it's slightly less scary enemies. And also this dungeon actually has way more than we're doing, so the dungeon in itself has six optional bosses, which if you, if you realize we have six characters in the party, and then there's six bosses. The reason for that is each optional boss unlocks the level 3 Mystic Art for one of the characters. And um, the level 3 Mystic Arts are stuff that we usually never see, but we will see it because of the... God, the donation incentive that we reached. So these are crystals that we're gonna break to form bridges, and whenever they break, they make bridges, and the bridges are sometimes loud. But that wasn't too loud, but sometimes, the further we get in the dungeon, the louder and louder these bridges forming will get, because the game kind of stacks all the audios on top of each other. So I will like give a slight like volume warning every time I get to one, because... It is inconsistent how loud they get, but sometimes they get really, really loud. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, it only lasts for a few, yeah. like one second, but yeah, it's enough to wake you up. Well, yeah, like even in hunt, uh, old bosses, I don't think you ever you even see Velvet's level three. No, I no. So Velvet's level 3 is actually very annoying to execute because you have to be in Therian form for a certain amount of time, like I think 20 seconds, and then she goes like into super Therian form. And then in that you have to do a certain combo to do it, and that's just longer than we can sustain in, in that category, so it's just not even worth it. It's just better to go for uh, the classic level 2 MA stuff. Because, yeah, um, in order to unleash uh, Velvet's level 2 MA, you need to do a combo of at least 8 arts, uh, which is, you know, pretty easy considering pretty easy, uh, yeah. whatever we've been doing so far. 
Yeah, the old boss's category actually does something else for later on fights, but we'll keep it a surprise and we'll see it in Ooh, the yeah. in the showcase after. There's better stuff than level three enemies. Yep, there is. <laughs> there is. Yeah, so here we have to go break that crystal over there. And on the way, there's a teleporter. It's actually very, very important that we go through it and come back. And the reason is the teleporters at the bottom doesn't activate unless you go through it here. So if you go through it and then back, it unlocks a shortcut that we can use later. If you don't do that, you actually have to run that whole area that I just ran again. Well, good morning. Yep. Oh, that's that was very low. <laughs> The second one sometimes is very loud, but that was very, very nice. Yeah. So, as you also can see on the minimap, we're almost at the Geo board. In this dungeon, we get it maybe a little bit past halfway. Yeah, something like that. And also, for some reason, in this game, whenever you get close to like light sources, the music gets slower. So it happened in some dungeons earlier where we ran over like sunlight. But it also happens here. For some reason, the music just gets so much quieter when you see this thing up here. I mean, look at it. It's pretty, pretty huge. So that is the G boards. We can start hoverboarding. Whee. And this is where this dungeon becomes really annoying casually because it's very confusing where you're supposed to go. And there's like, again, six optional bosses that there's so many different routes you can take and end up in, you know, where the bosses are instead of where you want to go. So here you see, like, a, a next room that you think you're supposed to go to, but you're actually supposed to jump down to break a crystal and then retrace all the steps you just did earlier. Thankfully, since we activated the teleporter, it's a little bit less retracing as than it could be, but... All right, again, volume warning. Let's see how loud this gets. That was pretty loud. That was loud. <laughs> Such a bad idea to make you go all the way down like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is the same area we passed by a little bit ago, but again, now we have the teleporter. Earlier, it wasn't there just because we couldn't go through it from the bottom. You can only go through it from the top. And now again, this whole screen that we just did, we have to do again. It's it's sort of final dungeon design. Just make you enjoy the music a little more, bit more. But it is like a, from what I get, like a Tales of Staple of having a very big and confusing final dungeon. A lot yeah, of the games do that. Do that. Though there is some dungeon set that. Actually, some actually some interesting content in it. That's how Soup Traces that has like six uh, bosses before the final boss in the final dungeon, or something like that. Traces is uh, a fantastic, very very interesting uh, speed uh, speed game. Probably one of the hardest one of the series, just because of uh, how the game works. Yeah, I know uh, Zestiria has a very seemingly confusing final dungeon, but then it's actually very short if you know where to go. Yeah. So in the speedrun with this fast speed and knowing where to go, it's like a less than five minute dungeon as opposed to 15 minutes in this run. I mean, we also, oh. <laughs> we also move super fast in, uh, in Zestiria. It's really, really bonkers. So this way I switch to Rokuro is if I get an encounter. I take no damage from any of these enemies since I'm in a tutorial. Oh, where was Roku? Right here, and I'll switch Aizen. Aizen is the same where his tutorial will pop up in any encounter. I pretty much didn't need to do it because we're almost at the end of the dungeon. I don't think there is even any more encounters here. Oh, there might be, just not the beetles. So there's <laughs> just easy encounters, but... Right. Yeah, there's this room. And yeah, just... Just in case. I mean, at worst, at this point, you just uh, pop up a practice save and uh, 
But then we won't see this Velvet beating up Artorias. True. <laughs> That'd be a shame. There's going to be, I think, like one room after this, and then we'll be to the fifth final. The boss, which again is going to be two back to back fights. So the first fight is going to be against Artorias and Inomi, not separate. And then the second fight is going to be them armatizing together. So it's going to be what we call Armatorias. And the, the first fight is definitely a lot harder because there are two enemies, like similar to. It's not exactly as the Aizen Zavid fight earlier, because that one is like a 4v1v1, this is a 4v2. But it's very easy to be attacking like Artorias and then Inomina comes and screws with you or something. So that way, that's why that fight is definitely tricky. We call it the Clown Fiesta fight. <laughs> it definitely is a Clown Fiesta. So Magilu isn't taking much part of it. <laughs> and then the second fight is actually super consistent. So. If you get lucky, it can go easier, but regardless, it should be a, a consistent combo that just works every time. So this will be the last screen before we basically get to the final boss. One more bridge forming, one more volume warning. This one is usually quiet, but... Who knows? Who knows? So we just have to go through this final big teleporter and then walk, well, skateboard up a very l Oh my god, I've never... <laughs> skateboard up this huge set of stairs and then we can fight the boss. I just have to put Aizen back in the spot. First, obviously, since there is an interlink, we are focusing out those first. Yep. So another important thing here is we need to get the Break Soul on him to get Discord. Sometimes Inomina just walks in front of him. Right, so as long as Inomina doesn't hit me here, I should be able to combo him. He's not going to quite die from the combo. It's one of those where we get him below his Soul Bursts and then kill him. So if he got, he almost got to 25% health, or 75, it's very important to make sure he doesn't, because he soul bursts there. And then we just clean him up. He's gonna get down here, so we just, as we said, Heaven's Claw picks him up. And this should kill him. And then, you know, Minot is... I think there was also like a soul link in him. I'm not yep. sure, but yeah. So now this guy's really weak. We just. Two. Just a bunch of health goes. Three. And two. Our good old MA. And there we go. It should do enough damage to kill him. It did. And now for the final Armatorius, the final boss of the run. So we can't kill it in one uh, MA because it's got that much HP. Yeah. We also need to put a lot of souls, a lot of souls in. So we're just going to keep so switching cool. as much as we can. Alright, so this should be enough. Now we just have to dump a bunch with Velvet so that she gets BG back. Actually, going to also use a soul bottle that I have. Luffy died. That's bad, actually. Okay, so, let's see how this is gonna work. It should work. He still has to BG, but... This is why we picked up the life bottles. Luffy said dying there to the to the boss really screwed it up because his level two MA is or Brixel is mandatory. Thankfully, this guy kills us very quickly, so we can just retry. It's like it's a final boss or something. Yeah. 
It's a very big step up in difficulty to other fights, like even casually. But at least there is no damage check. Alright. So voice again in order to get BG back. And now we just wait for him to do illusionary force. Static force in order to get and more stagger. He got burnt, so that means it, him getting burnt means for the second combo that we have to do on him, we actually have to do two. So here we do a first MA. And since he got a burn, I wouldn't have to do another Lofty Set level two uh, break soul. So usually I would switch to Lofty Set and switch him and Aizen back and forth. So before I forget, I have to do an Arcane Bottle. But since he got burnt, I don't have to do any of that. We'll just do the same combo again. And get ready on time. Yep. Time is when we see the screen fading out to white. After we go him. So time is coming up. Now. 429-03. So 430, pretty solid. All right, but since we have met the incentive of Mystic Art Showcase, we are not quite done here. So we're just going to return, and because a lot of the Mystic Arts take a while to unlock, I'm actually going to load up a save where I have them all unlocked. So to do it, I'm actually going to just change normal difficulty. And are there anything else we want to talk about before we get into the showcase, or should I just go ahead and get started with it? All right, so the main thing I'm going to be doing to showcase is I'm going to get into dangerous encounters so the enemies don't fall over easily. <laughs> so first we're going to do what is called an MA chain. So if you don't know what an MA chain is, you can actually chain Mystic Arts back to back, all six of them, by simply holding the MA button and an arrow D-pad towards the direction of the next character, you can do this. So that's uh, level two here. It's another level 2 for Lofty Set. And the MA chain makes you go into higher level of MAs as you go. So this is Roker's level 3 Mystic Art. That's and since we all like Velvet so much, this is her level 3 Mystic Art. Alright, so this was what... And MA chain is. So next off, I'm gonna show what we were mentioning earlier, which is how we do all bosses runs. So, in top of MA chains, oh, they killed those right there. <laughs> yeah. Since I'm in a, in a dangerous encounter, all the enemies are synced and level. Need, you'll need to use uh, another arcane bottle. Yep. Oh, oh, well, you see. I also need one Luffy because we need five. I hope you guys enjoy the love life team or whatever this is. Oh, I used it on the wrong person. We just get to hear the music for longer. This is actually one of the the DLC costumes that plays this music. All right. So here is what a dual mystic art is. So each two characters. Wait, I, I did the wrong thing. Yeah, that's definitely. A little <laughs> it's a little hard to execute, but you can actually do dual MAs where each two characters have. And a that they can do together. There we go. So Velvet and Lofty Set have this MA that they do together. And this is actually the old boss's MA that is used throughout the entire old boss's run or in the late game. But Velvet and Lofty are not the only one who have a dual mystic art. Aizen and Roker also have a great one. Which is this? And I think you don't have enough BG on Rokura. Oh, I thought he was on max. 
Let's see. Oh, I don't. Okay. Because they may chain. So we just have to get some MA. He has five now. This is enough. So we just have to start a combo up. Yeah, so executing some of these MAs are a little tricky, but we can see eyes and punching people. And another MA. Actually, what I'm gonna do is actually leave the fight. This is out of the fight. Yep, and then we can actually just elixir, so we don't have to keep elixiring the characters to get more EG on them. Yeah, so this should be easier now to show actual stuff without having to worry about BG. So again, we have to get into another dangerous encounter just to make sure the enemies don't die too easily. It's a lot of chickens, it's hard to get into. There we go. Oh. Are you sure about you? I think I have to do it with Rokuro, actually, maybe. So let's uh, switch to Rokuro real quick. I'm not sure why this is not working, but, you know, we'll just move on to the next MA for a bit. We'll show off the Mogilu and Eleanor one, which is also very cool. So make sure everyone has enough. They do. This is the Mogilu Eleanor dual mystic art. And I think one that we have to show off, it is a fan favorite, is Mogilu's level 3 mystic art. So I'll just make sure everyone has enough. And we can get started on another Mystic Art chain that we can show off. You at least have to show uh, Lafis X level 3 as well. Yep, we will. Oh yeah, that one we didn't show yet. Lafis X level 1. This is also one we didn't see. This was actually for a little bit part of the any percent route. Roker is level 2. Aizen. So not uh, could becoming a dragon. We'll get to see Velvets one more time. And finally Mogulus. After this. Army of she just shoots a bunch of Norman at the enemy, dealing a lot of damage to them. There we go. And so you said we want to see Lafisette's level Yeah. Level 3, so I'm going to switch to him. Actually, I'm just going to switch him out. Make sure everyone has enough BG to keep the chain going. He has 7, so he's good. He has 5. We just need to give one to Eleanor. Our good old beside a bunch. This actually we did not see either earlier. So. That's the level 2 for Mugulu. Indignation. And it kills the whole fight. You're not hurt. So we'll try to do the level uh, or the duel between Aizen and Rokura one more time. If it decides to go off. So I'll just get into one more dangerous encounter here. There we go. <laughs> this the Aizen Rokuro. There we go. We'll just uh, finish this fight off with just random MAs and then we can call it for the showcase. Because this is pretty much every MA that any of the main characters have. There are some very interesting MAs for the bosses, but unfortunately it's not easy to really showcase them.
All right, so I think that is pretty much all the MAs we could show off here. It's pretty much every MA for the whole party, so... That is all I have on my end. Thank you all so much for watching and thank you all for donating for this incentive and you know for all the other incentives for the run. And of course for all the donations for Nami. I want to thank RPG Limit Break for this awesome event and letting me be here. And then best of luck with the rest of the event everyone. I hope you enjoy everything. See you later. Great run, Lurking SR. That was amazing. We have a couple donations to get to. $15 from Anonymous with no comment. $15 from PK Ultima with no comment. Shout out to Piplup. But we're going to have to go to an ad, so stick around and we'll be right back.
Welcome back to RPG Limit Break 2022. We are coming to you live from Salt Lake City, Utah. We are raising money for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which was formed in 1979 as a grassroots advocacy organization by a group of parents whose children suffered with serious mental illnesses, and NAMI has maintained that focus to this day. You can donate to NAMI, and you can donate towards incentives. The loom incentive, visit the cleric's tower during the loom run, has been met. And the next run after that is Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. You can choose the ending, and currently Shijima is beating Musubi by about $50. If you want to fuse the all-powerful Mothman, you're going to need to get those donations in. Only $10 out of 750 You can name the top two classmates. Currently, someone is trying to error out the game by using a hashtag null as, as a name. And then the second name in there is Hamburger. So if you want another name besides those two, or if you just like those two, go ahead and get your donations in for that incentive. You can also name the main character in Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. Currently leading with $70 is Kalis, followed by Renoko, and of course, Jerkbird with $1. If you want to name the teacher, you're going to have to really beat Onizuka. That has $150. The closest name to Onizuka is Flutter with 2222. Piplup doesn't wear shirts, but you do. And a good thing, because we are uh, teaming up with the Yeti. That's Y-E-T-E-E dot -E -E com slash R-P-G-L-B. The Yeti is donating $5 from each shirt sold directly to NAMI.
We have a $25 donation from PT Fusion. Ha! 